it's great to see see your faces. Hello. I'm seeing a lot of people from the team scared of uh, I'm yeah. also seeing myself echoing. <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear that. Perfect. Um, yeah, well, we can go ahead and get started since we're at the top of the hour if we have every everyone from the, the first team here. Looks like we do have quite a few people. Um, someone from Team Scaregrow, would you mind just confirming in the chat that um, all of your members are here? Yes, yes, they are all here. Great. Then I think we're okay to go ahead and kick things off, right, Mubarak? Yes, that's right. All good. We're live on YouTube. Great. Then officially, hello and welcome everyone to the 2023 Fishbowl Challenge Finals. We're so excited for today's event and even more excited that all of you are able to join us for it. Um, I'm Katie and I lead venture growth at Fishbowl. So normally I get the amazing job of helping to select our challenger cohort and then some um, supporting our winning teams as they launch their ventures. But today I also get to be your MC for the exciting next few hours. Working with this cohort of challengers has been a constant source of hope, inspiration, and a reminder of the power that driven young people around the world have when they work together to solve our most pressing global problems. And the five finalist teams we're about to see have worked tirelessly over the past six months to develop innovative solutions to these challenges, despite the fact that they've never met, many of them have never met each other in person. At the end of the next few hours, some of these solutions will be funded and these teams are gonna be taking the next step in their journey of making an impact through entrepreneurship. And we're so excited to have everyone here on the call and on the live stream with us for this exciting day. And after having seen the amazing growth of these teams since August, I can promise that we are in for a treat and I can't wait to see what all of you have in store for us. Um, with that, I'll hand things over to Vanana, co-founder of the Fishbowl Challenge, to tell us more about the challenge and today's event. Vanana, over to you. Thank you, Katie. Welcome, everyone. This is our fourth Fishbowl final, um, and it's we have an amazing global audience here today. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about Fishbowl Challenge. Some of you are joining to support your friends and family that may be participating. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about the journey they've been on as well. So a group of us founded Fishbowl Challenge in 2019, and uh, we had a very simple vision. We wanted to support social entrepreneurs around the world. Uh, because we believed that young people had some really ambitious ideas to make positive impact in their communities. Uh, we wanted to support these and help them solve some really important social and environmental problems while creating employment in their communities. Um, along the way, as we thought about the world becoming more connected, um, you know, people say the world is shrinking, uh, through the pandemic, I think this was further validated. Uh, what we also wanted to bring to you was the opportunity for uh, young people to connect with their peers yeah. around the world. So we thought it'd be pretty amazing if uh, a student somewhere in Africa could work with a student in North America and have someone from Europe on their teams. So we started with this very high level idea that had some youth development, some social entrepreneurship, some global problem solving. And we said, let's put it out there and let's see what happens. Well, you blew us away. Every single one of our participants over the last four years, the numerous people who have stepped forward to support us, we were just blown away and truly humbled by the support as well as the participation that we received. Every year, uh, the challenge has received between 500 to 100, uh, 500 to 1,000 applications from over 90 countries. Um, if you don't mind switching to the next slide, Mubarak, thank you. Um, our globally diverse challenger network 
is represented in over 32 countries now across five continents. Uh, we um, foster this alumni community. We want these entrepreneurs to be able to lean on each other, have a counterpart to visit anywhere in the world. And we're well on our way to establishing that. Uh, some of us on our team are in fact uh, startup founders. And what we know about startup founders is very often it's not the first idea that sticks. It's the second one or the third one, but the entrepreneur never stops. The show goes on, the ideas keep blooming, and we wanted to give our challengers not just support for an idea today, but an alumni network for the future. So that's what we are building as well. Uh, we are on a mission and on track right now to build 20 uh, tech-enabled social ventures across the world by 2025. So that was a goal statement we put out for ourselves a couple of years ago. I'm happy to share that as of today, we've reached over 5,000 entrepreneurs around the world. These are the folks who have applied to our competitions. Uh, we have supported, or by 2025, we will have supported 600 entrepreneurs. We've already supported over 400 through the challenge. Um, and uh, we are at least halfway, if not more, to the social ventures built through uh, Fishbowl Challenge so far. Um, I also wanted to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about the journey that the teams go on and share some of the winning stories with you. So the team members that get uh, admitted into the program go through over six months, if they make it all the way to the final, it's almost eight months of a pretty intensive path. Uh, they start from never having met each other uh, to becoming uh, team members, coming up with an idea, uh, submitting that to us. Uh, we read every single pitch uh, and one pager that we receive. And then a select number of those go through elimination rounds, present to judges, and then get to be here today presenting live. We have five teams and Katie will be introducing them to you shortly. Um, but here are a couple of folks who were in the hot seat not that long ago. Uh, one team, Ecofresh, is addressing post-harvest losses in Africa. Uh, Ghana in particular is the pilot country. That's where Mateus, the one of the uh, founders is based. Uh, they have set up a solar powered refrigeration unit um, so that the crop in that in this case is tomato, so that tomato can be stored before it gets to market. And uh, the farmers have much higher yield. They get much better pricing because they don't have to take everything to market right away. They can actually hold it in refrigeration and take smaller amounts to market and therefore get better prices. Um, their spoilage, the spoilage problem was huge and Ecofresh is able to address that. One of the things we take pride at with Fishbowl Network, uh, with the network of partners as well that we're building, is that our teams don't just stop with us. They go on to present at a number of other events around the world. They get invited to some really prestigious forums. Uh, people like Matthias, and I'll uh, talk about Stanley in a minute, but some of, our, um, some of our participants have gone on to be invited to the World Economic Forum in Davos. They've presented at World Bank events in Washington, DC. Uh, this is truly a gateway uh, to hopefully many amazing opportunities for them. Um, Ecofresh in particular received $45,000 in funding after Fishbowl. So they received $25,000 from us as their prize money and then another $45,000 after that. So what we also have learned is that uh, for our uh, entrepreneurs, the journey doesn't end at Fishbowl. It very much starts here and we want to continue to support them uh, through the rest of the journey as well. Switching over to the, the next team is Lighted, um, Yuli, Stanley and Naima. They are helping school children in Nigeria get access to solar powered lighting. So the kids have a solar powered unit that they take home with them. So they can, even if there are power outages, they can do their homework with that lantern. Uh, they bring it back to school the next day. While they are at school, the unit recharges. 
uh, and the cycle repeats itself, right? So um, this has been, it started off with students and families. They have a lot of ambitious ideas to extend this to small businesses as well. Uh, they raised money with us, but then also went on to raise an additional $25,000 uh, post fishbowl. And like I mentioned, uh, most recently, I think this was literally last week, Stanley won, Stanley and the team won the Amazon uh, social shifters competition, which was also a very prestigious global competition. So uh, it's just been amazing to see their journeys continue to thrive. Uh, when, when we switch over, I also had a little video that I wanted to take a few minutes to share with you, but I wanted to also say, we can't do this without you. Uh, Mubarak, if you don't mind just going back to the Canva for a minute. Great, thank you. Just one more slide. Uh, we can't do this without you. So we have had so many of you step up and be our volunteers over the years. Uh, Fishbowl is entirely a volunteer run competition. Our core team, which runs the event year round, uh, is, is around 10 people based out of seven countries. And many of us have never met either. So we embody the same values of global connectivity um, that Fishbowl does. Um, we also have leaned heavily on our networks of experienced business mentors uh, to step up and um, provide guidance and expertise to the teams. So we will continue to do that. If any folks listening uh, on right now are interested in volunteering with Fishbowl or mentoring a team, we would love to hear from you. And finally, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't mention that all of this is only possible uh, because of your generosity as well. We are a nonprofit organization and every dollar we receive goes directly to helping our teams and our challengers. So. Uh, for those of you who have donated in the past, we're very grateful. Uh, we hope you'll continue your support. And for those who haven't given to Fishbowl before, we hope you'll consider adding us to, your, to the list of causes you support. Um, so with that, Mubarak, if you could cut over to, uh, or I can share, I have the video. I wanted this group uh, to have a chance to get to know one of our teams a little bit better. And I just need access to sharing the video or I can put it. Okay, great, you have it there, perfect. Uh, Mubarak, we can't hear the audio on that. Sorry, so no, let, let me, Leah, yeah, let me, you can speak. Let me try to go back. Yeah, let's do this. I know we're going to have a break uh, between teams. So it'd be great just to run this video during the break. Uh, it's just a little inspiration. It's a little note of inspiration, uh, hopefully uh, for our challenges as well, because we're really hoping that many of them from today will still be with us in the years to come. So we'll share this video with you during the next break. Uh, but a heartfelt thank you from all of us to you and good luck to the teams today and over to Katie to introduce our judges and take this away. Let's do this. Thanks so much, Vanana. Um, a few quick rules before we jump into the exciting pieces of introducing our judges and of course um, what we're all here for hearing from our challengers. Um, first, as a reminder, this session is being recorded to be able to share with friends and family and anyone else interested in the exciting ideas being discussed today. So to ensure we can hear the presenters and judges clearly, please stay on mute unless you're speaking. And this includes muting yourself if one of your team members is presenting. Second, please respect the time limits that we've set. That's a maximum of 10 minutes for presentations and 15 minutes for Q&A. This is critical not just to keep our event on track, but to respect the time needs of the other teams. During your presentation, I'll give you a heads up at the three minute mark out loud, and then you'll be prompted with a chat message at the five minute and one minute mark, just so you can keep an eye on time. So watch the chat for that. Also, if you're not a challenger or a judge, we're so happy to have you with us today. 
but please keep yourself on mute for the duration of the finals. We love to see your enthusiasm and comments on the live stream, but we want to be fair to all teams and make sure there are no disruptions during the presentations themselves. And one last tip, if anyone does have bandwidth or connectivity issues arise, we recommend turning off video if you don't have a great connection. So now that the house rules are out of the way, allow me the pleasure of introducing today's judges. We have an amazing panel with us, and I'd love to have the opportunity to say a few words about them before we get started. First up, we have Rob Shelton. Rob is a renowned Silicon Valley-based advisor, author, and speaker on entrepreneurship and innovation. He co-founded and is the board chair of the Scaling and Replication Program at the Miller Center for Social Entrepreneurship, a social impact leader and global mentoring center. He's also a co-founder of Weaving Impact, which addresses the racial wealth gap in U.S. urban centers. He co-authored the best-selling book, Making Innovation Work, and his work has been featured in various high-profile publications and events around the world. He's also no stranger to the Fishbowl Challenge, and we couldn't be more excited to welcome, back, welcome him back as a judge this year. Rob, thank you so much for being here, and are there any words that you want to share with the challengers before we kick things off today? Thank you, Katie. I just wanted to say I'm looking forward to hearing about your vision and, and your execution, and uh, I'll have some questions and comments along the way, so it should be a very interesting exchange. Looking forward to it, thanks. Great, thank you so much, Rob. Next up, we have William or Bill Egby. Bill is the former president of Coca-Cola Africa and served as chairman of the Coca-Cola Foundation Africa. Bill has held operating leadership roles at AT&T, British Petroleum, and Eastman Kodak, and also worked on the World Economic Forum's New Vision for Agriculture Initiative in New York. Currently, he serves on the board of several companies in sustainability and philanthropy, and as a member of the board of trustees of the Jacobs Foundation, which works to develop a sustainable ecosystem to ensure access to high-quality education and improve livelihoods in the cocoa-growing regions in Ivory Coast and Ghana. We are very lucky to have Bill bringing yes, his yes. insight and experience to the panel today. And so thank you so much and welcome, Bill. Anything that you'd like to share with our challengers before we get started? Thanks, Katie. Um, it's just a pleasure to be able to participate in uh, an event such as this. I'm looking forward to listening to all this great, great and innovative ideas. Thank you. And last but definitely not least, rounding out our amazing judging panel today is the Fishbowl Challenge's very own executive director, Debbie Adejumo. Debbie has firsthand experience in a range of design, entrepreneurship, and operational roles, from leading UX design at Ramani, a fast-growing Y Combinator-backed startup in Tanzania, to her role as executive director at Fishbowl, to being the co-founder of Warble, a design studio serving small businesses and entrepreneurs. As an entrepreneur herself, Debbie knows what it takes to build a digitally enabled business from the ground up, and also what it takes for a team to build out a product, scale, and look to drive widespread adoption. We could not be happier to have Debbie's firsthand startup experience on the panel today. Debbie, over to you if you have anything you wanna share with the challengers. Uh, thanks, Katie. I'm really, really excited to see, you know, the culmination of the past six months of hard work that each challenger has been putting in. Um, and I'm looking forward to learning more about how far your ventures have grown over the past few months and, you know, probing them a bit further today. Great. Thank you so much, Debbie. And with that, without further ado, let's jump into the final presentations. As Vandana mentioned, we are going to hear from five amazing final teams today, representing countries all over the world. Our judges will be evaluating these contestants and they have $50,000 to allocate to the final teams as they see fit. Please join me in wishing them the best of luck. And without further hesitation, I'd like to welcome our first finalists for their presentation. As a reminder, team, you'll have 10 minutes to present and then 15 minutes for judges Q&A. And first up, we have Team Scarecrow, developing precision agriculture technology to improve yields for smallholder and commercial farms. Take it away, team. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mubarak, are you presenting? 
Hello, Mubarak, can you hear me? Hello. We can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. I think uh, Mubarak's probably. Yeah, I, I would be controlling the slides. OK, OK. Can you put it in the slideshow mode, please? Just actually starting with the video presentation first. OK, I will start with this. Can you share the video? But also a very challenging one. Farmers face a number of obstacles when it comes to managing their crops, such as unpredictable weather, pests, and diseases. Keeping up with all these variables can be very overwhelming, and it's hard to make the best decision for your crops. This is where Scarebrew comes in. At Scarebrew, we are developing farm monitoring solutions to help farmers increase their yield and profit. We are using artificial intelligence and sensor technology to create an application as well as other monitoring solutions where farmers can use it to monitor their crops, detect for diseases and pests, as well as other functions such as humidity and temperature that are capable of affecting their farms and yields. To access all of our services, the farmer will need to download our application. From there, he can sign up on the application and log in using his credentials. After signing up, the farmer can access a whole range of services for farm operations, including monitoring of crops with our vision-enabled artificial intelligence system, which can be operated from his own cameras. He can also connect to a range of IoT devices, which we are providing to improve monitoring of crops. The farmer can also choose to speak to agronomy experts who are available on our platform to consult for more advanced problems. Skigger also has a marketplace feature that allows farmers to sell their crops directly to the buyers, making it easy for them to reach a wider market and increase their revenue. With this feature, farmers can sell their crops at a fair price while also allowing the buyers to purchase fresh and high quality produce. For the past six months, we have achieved a lot at Scare Group, including the development of the prototype of our mobile application, as well as our farm monitoring hardware. We have also successfully carried out a pilot in northern Nigeria, where our farm monitoring solution is being used by over 10 industrial farms. Today, we are here to seek for your investment and support to help us launch and scale our solution in the market. I want to let you know that an investment in Skybrew is an investment in sustainable farming and a future free of crop loss. Okay, we're on, we're on the slide now. Okay, if you can put it in the slideshow mode, please. Uh, hello, Mubarak, can you put it in the slideshow mode, please? Okay, uh, the first slide, first slide. Um, yep. Hi, Scarebrew is a crop monitoring system which is using a mobile application and sensor technology to revolutionize the way farmers manage their crops. Our goal is to empower farmers with information and tools they need to maximize productivity on their farms. Next slide. Crop loss is a major problem faced by farmers and the entire agricultural industry. Causes of crop loss include diseases and pest attacks, harsh climatic conditions, and the lack of sweet monitoring and detection of the factors leading to crop loss. Traditional methods of crop monitoring are time-consuming, labor-intensive, and often provide inaccurate or incomplete information leading to suboptimal crop management practices, reduced yields, and low profits. According to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, over 16% of crop yields are lost every year due to pest damage 
and plant diseases. This is a major problem, particularly in developing countries where the majority of population relies on agriculture for their livelihoods. At Scarecrow, we believe that technology can help to address these challenges and empower farmers with the information they need to make better decisions and improve their yields. Next slide, please. And this is where Scarecrow comes in. Scarecrow is the solutions that farmers have been waiting for. Our mobile application uses the power of AI and IoT sensors to provide real-time information about crop conditions such as temperature, humidity, um, as well as plant growth to allow for the timely detection of any crop diseases. Scarecrow uses low-cost ESP32 cameras in, in pairing with microprocessors, along with humidity and temperature sensors, and can be accessed and controlled from any web browser, including a lo local area network or the internet, if available, making it simple and low-cost to use. Next slide, please. With Scarecrow, along with our app-based use of Azure Cognitive Services and Trade Machine Learning Model, farmers can also monitor their crops remotely and receive alerts about potential issues and make data-driven decisions to improve their yields. Our app also provides farmers with recommendations for crop diseases and treatment, along with best practices to increase their crop yield. And we're not stopping there. We're also building Scarecrow to include a market-based market uh, market ma market platform where farmers can sell their crops directly to the buyers. And this would bypass the traditional supply chains and increase their profits by giving them another platform. Scarecrow is more than just an app. It is a complete, comprehensive ecosystem that empowers farmers to maximize their yields, improve their bottom line, and secure their futures. Next slide, please. At Scarecrow, we are leveraging a robust business model. First, we will be generating revenue through app subscriptions. Farmers will have access to our platform for a monthly fee of three US dollars, giving them access to real-time data and insights on their crops. Secondly, we are also selling our hardware sensors, which include camera sensors and humidity and temperature sensors to farmers who want to take advantage of our a platform but don't have the necessary equipment and finally we will be collecting small commissions of two percent on sales made through our in-app marketplace for farm produce this will allow farmers to sell their crops directly to buyers cutting out the middlemen and increasing profits and with over five million potential farmers in nigeria alone the potential for growth and profitability of scale grow is enormous next slide in in Nigeria, where we're currently operating our pilot program, there are already existing companies that offer similar services, such as two Scarecrow, such as Farm Crowdy, Thrive Agric, and Hello Tractor, which are usually based uh, in order to connect investors with farmers or better tractor companies. However, these companies do not offer a crop monitoring feature like we do at Scarecrow. Scarecrow differentiates, differentiates itself by providing a comprehensive monitoring system and solution that utilizes sensors, such such as cameras and humidity and temperature sensors. Furthermore, our in-app marketplace really ties everything in together for farmers to sell their produce and provide an additional revenue stream for the company. Next slide, please. Our business has a huge market potential with the global agri-tech market estimated to be worth over $19 billion in 2021 and projected to reach over $46 billion by 2030. Our service addressable market for now, focuses on Africa with a market size of over $2.3 billion. That is a huge market potential. To get even more specific, our service obtainable market, which is currently in Northern Nigeria and potentially in Southwestern Colombia has a combined size of over $12 million. A significant opportunity for us to make real impact. And it is not just about the numbers. We know that farmers in this region face a range of farming challenges and Scarecrow is uniquely positioned to help address these challenges and empower farmers to achieve greater success. Next slide. Three minutes remaining team. Scarecrow is dedicated to providing value to its customers, particularly smallholder farmers in developing countries who lack the resources to effectively monitor and optimize their yields. Based on our market research, we have learned that affordability, ease of use, and accessibility are key priorities to our target customers. And by providing cost-effective platform, we aim to empower these farmers to improve the yields of their crops, increase profitability, and enhance their livelihoods. Next slide. 
For the past six months, we have done tremendous work in bringing our products to life, and now we need your support to do more. We are requesting for an investment of $15,000 to launch Scale Grow and expand our impact. Among these, $8,500 will be allocated to our final pilot program in Nigeria in selected communities to test and refine our app and hardware, and $2,000 will be used for company incorporation, as well as, as, well as $3,000 which will cover miscellaneous costs. Next slide. Sorry, Joseph, you are mute. Scale growth value proposition aims to reduce hunger and crop loss while promoting responsible consumption. Our technology provides farmers with real time data and insights into their crops, helping them identify potential issues early on and to take corrective actions to prevent crop loss. This not only helps to increase crop yield, but also promote sustainable agriculture and support local economies. Our in-app marketplace also provides a platform for farmers to connect with buyers and sell their produce at fair prices, furthermore pro promoting responsible consumption by empowering farmers with the tools and insight they need. Scale Grow contributes to achieving the U.S. SDGs of zero hunger and responsible consumption and production. Next slide, please. Our team is made up of committed and talented young people from varying backgrounds from different countries with a desire for impact. The team is led by myself, Icho Joshua, an award-winning entrepreneur from Nigeria with passion for agriculture and technology. Our chief technical officer is Isha Patel from India, who is a student of electronics engineering studying in the United States. We also have Oya Joseph, our operations officer from Nigeria, and Steve Odinkaro, our software developer. Together, we are committed to improving sustainable agriculture. Today, I want to let you know that an investment in scale growth is an investment in sustainable agriculture. That is why we seek your support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Team Scaregrow. What a way to kick off the presentation. And um, really, really impressive that you already have farmers using your technology. Um, so thank you again and amazing job. Now, I'd like to turn things over to our judging panel for some Q&A. Katie, I'll start off if it's all right. Sounds great. With you and with the uh, judges. Um, <clears throat> impressive presentation and well thought out business model and certainly an issue uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, I, I have a question around your marketing and growth side. You're very heavily emphasized, your, your team is mostly technology oriented folks. Um, who are you going to hire to help you um, market and sell and grow this, which are things that are outside of the traditional software programming and engineering excellence that you already have? What kind of plans do you have for, for that kind of expansion? Yes. So um, we are looking at uh, a number of uh, companies that we are going to partner with. Just um, yesterday, uh, in Geneva, we had a meeting with um, Seed Studios, with a representative of Seed Studios, who are an industrial manufacturer of uh, these sensors, and um, we had an understanding. So we are looking at this range of companies who are going to be consulting for us and partnering with us professionally, as well as agricultural companies who are going to be working with us in order to market our product. And this is uh, going to come in form of um, partnerships and support from these companies. That's an excellent response. And I'm glad to hear that. Let me offer one bit of advice, which is I see that you list Hello Tractor as a potential competitor. And they represent not only a competitor, but potentially a partner too, because they offer the execution side of preparing the soil and, and helping farmers you know, make the crops that you all are then going to monitor. So as you look to partner with uh, technical providers of sensors and the like, you also might consider broadening the offer by being able to, you know, bring in other things that um, farmers need. Just a bit of experience in terms of farmers like complete solutions, not just partial solutions. Yes, sir. Noted. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, Tim, thanks a lot for a very, very exciting presentation. Um, I'm going to piggyback on some of the uh, areas that Rob was 
was proven. And I want to focus on competition. I, I know that there, there are a couple of other startups who have similar solutions in the marketplace. And I always say to startups that it's important to make sure that you deeply uh, explore and understood what else has been offered out there to make sure that what you offer has a new distinctive uh, advantage over what is on the market. Otherwise, you should seek to co collaborate and license and you know, join forces to amplify the solution. So um, I want to talk about two particular competitors that I think you should consider exploring. One is a company called Agrix, Agrix Tech, started by, uh, it was started two years ago by um, a group in Cameroon, Adamu Kutu, and um, they, they have a solution that combats crop pests and illnesses, leveraging AI. They use text and speech recognition in local languages to help um, deal with, um, you know, the, the, the lack of, um, you know, sophistication among the farmers at, at rural, in rural areas. So um, consider, you know, exploring what they've done. It's very similar to what we're doing. Um, they're also early stage. There's another company that's more advanced, um, Aerobotic. Startup and company started about, about six, seven years ago, uh, based in, in Cape Town. They use aerial imaging and machine learning to maximize, uh, to figure out how to, um, to maximize uh, crop yields and identify diseases and deal with them at the plant level. And I think, you know, um, these, understanding these kinds of competitive solutions, how they help to refine your solution and figure out if there's potential to partner. Um, so I just I just encourage you to, to dig deeper into the competitive landscape. Um, and then my final comment is about um, uh, the um, you know the, the estimates of the cost for what you need to do in, in, in the next uh, couple of months. I always say that um, you know uh, I like to see these low cost approaches, but um, always assume that it's going to cost you a little bit more. And you have to figure out if you only have limited amounts of resources, what are you going to prioritize along the long, among the long list of things that we have to do? So um, uh, yeah, just keep that in mind. It may cost you more than you think to really get this going and figure out what you should prioritize among the, the list of things that you listed out as things you wanted to do. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we particularly keen on the, thanks for the great presentation team. Uh, I'm keen on the pilots that you mentioned already. You've already run with about 10 different farms or farmers. What has the impact of using your application so far been? Yes, so um, our application particularly was used um, with um, these farmers in Northern Nigeria. And uh, from there, we were able to carry out a dictation of uh, diseases, particularly such as um, diseases on tomato and cucumber, particularly at um, Unania farms in just Nigeria. So we're able to carry out a timely dictation of these diseases and automatically we, um, the application was able to recommend solutions and also connect these farms with agronomy experts who were able to consult for them. Although um, this pilot was very, very uh, limited because we had to um, raise um, our own sort of funding to drive this. So we, we moving forward with a more substantial funding, we are going to carry out a more robust um, final pilot, which we translate into the launch of our product into the market. Thanks for sharing that. And it's great to hear that, you know, your pilots already have some impact um, there. And uh, I guess a follow-up question, because you mentioned that the application is what you'd use to monitor the crops. Um, have you already, do you already know what the landscape is around how many of these farmers have access to smartphone devices and how that monitoring will be if it's based off of the mobile device and not a different hardware that's stationed at the farms? Yes. So um, for for Nigeria, we um, there's a smartphone penetration of um, up to 70 percent. And for the industrial farms we work with, that, that is the greenhouses. They are very, very open to accepting these technologies, at least for the ones that are, are low cost. Uh, yes. So um, those particular farms, um, which who are among our major customers, that is um, the greenhouses, um, we did a survey which show that almost 98% uh, of this farm can access these um, 
smartphones to use our technology. And then with the 70% penetration among um, the other farmers, we are also looking at uh, a high acceptance rate for um, the, the smallholder farmers. Right. Thanks. Thanks for that answer. Katie, I have one comment um, that I'd like to pass on. Joshua, uh, again, excellent presentation. There's something I didn't see or hear clearly, uh, and if it's in there, pardon me, but I saw this, the crop improvement, uh, yield improvement that you can deliver with the the business model that you have, but I, I didn't see the dollar savings or the social impact that that has for the farmers. So it would be good to see that pathway from crop and yield improvement to uh, improved financial yield to um, actual social impact, as in, you know, nutrition for the children is improved or livelihoods are improved in general. I, I think there's a, there's a connection between what you're doing on a technology standpoint and the impact that's there. I just didn't see it clearly. And I'm sure it's there, it just needs to be stated. So I, I encourage you to do that. Yes, sir, noted, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, I think we'll wrap up with Rob as the, the last comment and just really appreciate the feedback and questions from the judging panel. Definitely some great things for the team to think about. And again, thank you so much Team Scarecrow for A, kicking us off on a high note and B, for all of your work so far and um, best of luck going forward. And I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. So, Let's start with a big virtual round of applause for our first team. The first is always the trickiest. So thank you guys so much. Amazing. So the next team that we have up is Team Kasavity. Um, and sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> I'm sure we'll hear from the team how, how to pronounce it in just a second. But um, do we have, before we start, do we have all of the members of the team here? Can someone just confirm verbally or in the chat? Yes, yes, we are here. I'm Umara. Can you start the video, please? Yes, start to the video. All right, give me a quick second. I would yes. load that up. So this team has been working hard on um, the agro processing of cassava for improving its shelf stability and using it to develop feedstock for animals. Um, so we're very excited to see what this team has in store for us now. And just as a note for all teams, um, any technical transition time where we're pulling up your video or switching between your slides does not count towards your total presentation time. So we're making sure that you're still getting the, the full 10 minutes. I am Francis Johnsise in Sierra Leone, one of the co-founders of Cassavity. The problem we are trying to solve here is to reduce the amount of post-harvest loss of cassava for rural farmers and also use the cassava to produce and sell flour in the market. Because of lack of buyers, I find it very difficult to sell at my cassava farm. It normally leads to price exploitation and post harvest losses. But because of this initiative, I've not been able to have a market for my cassava and make more profit. As you can see over there, here is my baking place, and uh, where I normally produce bread and supply it to, to my customers. But for now, it's not easy because the cost of the flour, because of the cost of the imported flour in the market is very, very high. But for now, if I have any flour or local flour for me to use and to produce a bride and give out to my customer, 
it will be very very okay for me the cassava must be properly washed to ensure safety the removal of the cassava store is cutting into pieces as this is a local method, no use of machine, so no moisture content or temperature rates can be calculated. All we can do is to know the quantity of cassava involved and rate it to a particular days that it can be dried and ready for milling. And also this is a very crucial area because the cassava is being left in the open to dry. It can attract bacteria and other impurities. So, to prevent all this, we have to monitor and be very close to the area of drying cassava. The cassava flour is being grind and prepared for baking of cakes, bread, or frying of cakes. The remains of the cassava peels that can be used as an essential feed for animals. The cake is so delicious. I can't imagine that this cake was made out of cassava. The cake is nice, it's so good. Okay. Ah, as we all heard about the opinions on this cassava flour, which is transformed to this cake. It's really nice. Can you please put it on a full screen? Thank you. Um, dear members of the jury, fishbowl challengers and guests, I greet you all. My name is Brenda from Cameroon and I'm part of Team Cassavity, a team of five young entrepreneurs from five different African countries. Ambrose, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Due to Russia Ukraine draw, which has drastically increased the price of imported risk, which is being imported to Sierra Leone from 30, 30, 30 US dollars to 43 US dollars. And this has led to a close of, close of five business out of 10 we have contacted. Not only that, more than 50,000 tons of cassava post harvest loss is experienced every year by rural farmers. Literally meaning each farmer loses up to 100 US dollars per year. There's no major cassava market in Sierra Leone. And a graph on your right shows how the cassava, how, how the price of wheat has affected the big root over the recent years. As Team Cassavity, we came up with a very simple solution to use cassava to make cassava flour so that it can be used in perfect, to making professional and also animal feeds. Our cassava will be high quality and also we shall sell them at affordable price. Each bag will cost for 23 US dollars. And this will reduce post harvest loss by 25% in the first six months of our operation. We shall hope to create sustainable business, sustainable market for cassava throughout the year. On the, on the left, on the right hand side is a process uh, of how to convert this cassava flow and also as, as seen in the video. Allow me to, to, to leave it to Francis to put in. Thank you. Our impact. Our impact. Next slide, please. Our impact. Is this our initiative? We reduce hunger by two percent in three years within the first eight months. Let's say when you buy your cassava flour, you will have the opportunity to produce donuts or bread in the morning before going out, or having a dinner with it before going to bed. And it also has some nutritional value. Within the first six months, we employ 300 small farmers, of which 60% of them are going to be women. We are also going to help in the fight against food insecurity in Sierra Leone, of which 10% of them is going to be women who have just graduated from university. We have to empower 10 young graduates who have just graduated, but will not get a job in Sierra Leone. Next slide, please. This is our business model of 50 kilograms of our cassava flour. One kilogram of it is cost $2.2. 
our total value will cost, which is $30, and the total fixed cost, which come up to $26. The total value will cost, and the fixed cost of one kilogram cost of $1.15, with a profit margin of 50%. This was a mathematical error, so to be 50%. With a profit margin of 50%. Next slide. Now to our target market. We are targeting bakeries in Sierra Leone, pastry shops, households, and animal food industries. Next slide, please. And here is our market analysis. Our total addressable market in Sierra Leone covers the 83% of the chart, and which amounts to 184 million dollars. Our serviceable market is Freetown. Freetown happens to be the largest city in Sierra Leone and it covers a total of $46 million. And we have a target market of Bu, Kabema, Koidu, and Makeni, and it covers 5%. Thank you. Next slide, please. Well, for your financial projection plan, across the four years, we expect to see a steady growth in revenue. In the first year, we expect to raise over $34,500 out of our 1,500 kilograms of as our flour will produce. Along to the fourth year, we expect to produce 6,000 kg of cassava flour, which will earn us around 138,000 US dollars. Next slide, please. So this is our traction. So far, through our community engagement, as well as our testing phase, we've conducted market research in McKinney City and Macabora, We've met over 20 bakery owners and 50 farmers of cassava and McKinney and Bull City. We've also produced over 50 kg of cassava flour, which we made a 100% sale. We've sold it at $220 and made a 96% profit margin. Three minutes. Next slide, please. In addition to the mentor assigned to us by Fishbowl, we can start having a second mentor who is an expert in food processing and is going to help us to calculate the nutritional content of our product. And our product is, um, is gluten-free, high in carbohydrate, rich in fibers, low in glycemic index, rich in antioxidant, uh, antioxidants. Next slide, please. Also, when comparing our product with the common wheat flour in the market, our product is more affordable, more accessible, um, gluten-free, has a cheaper cost of production, and is going to create job opportunities. Next slide. The competitors we have currently in Sierra Leone, we have Isan, Laide, Doing Industry, and Tapioca Flour. All these companies um, import flour. They are more expensive, expensive than our flour, and they're not as available as our flour. Next slide. So we asked for 35,200 US dollars to help us implement our project. This money will be spread across the production cost, cost of labor, as well as the machinery. Next slide, please. This is our roadmap for the next eight months. If we are, which one is done? The first thing we are going to do is the construction of the factory space and do the business legislation. And this other month, we are going to purchase and install the machine. And in, up to December, we are going to increase our production scale up to 1,500 kilograms. Of which 30% is going to be the market share and employ 10 young graduates. And in June, we are going to go in for the full certification process and increase our production scale up to 3,000 kilograms and increase our market share to 40%. And in 2020, we are thinking about launching this our initiative in Uganda. Next slide, please. This is our team full of diverse people with diverse skills. Francis Achai from Sierra Leone is going to help as a production manager. Zazuni Kasava Flossin Taiho. Hi, myself, I'm Rosina Baralbi, financial manager. I have skills in financial literacy. Hemi Topi is from Nigeria, is helping us with marketing marketing of our product. We have Kajitan, he's IT manager, he's helping us managing social media, creating website, and Brenda will be helping us in community engagement. Thank you so much for listening. We hope so that you can join us so that you can bring smile in the faces of farmers in rural areas in Sierra Leone, not only in Sierra Leone, but also in whole Africa. Join us so that you can create more employment. Thank you so much for listening.
Thank you so much team for another great presentation and really impressive traction that you've also shown so far. So really appreciate um, you sharing this with us today. And now I'll hand things over to our judging panel for some Q&A. Thank you. Well, I'll go again. <clears throat> At least I'll start things off. Um, and I, I'll say that, that that was a very impressive presentation. And I, I applaud the social impact that you uh, project and also the, uh, the general approach. I, I have a question for the team. How well do you think that this model will scale in Uganda as well as in other places? What makes this a particularly scalable business model? I'm just did I ask a dumb did I ask a dumb question or no, is no, this just no, no. <laughs> no so, sometimes I ask dumb questions don't get me wrong I, I just wanted there was such silence I needed to find out what was going on no give me give me your thoughts maybe it's not something you've thought about a lot but this gives okay. an idea about how applicable this solution model is uh, not just in the initial market that you're thinking about but beyond that so give me your thoughts on that please Okay, thank you so much for that question. Uh, let me go first, maybe some of our colleagues want to join. Uh, what do you think, what we think about how our business is like, it can be really scalable because currently, uh, first of all, the world is really, mostly Africa is really facing a lot of challenges in, in importing it because of the Russia, Ukraine war. And currently uh, in Uganda, let me give an example of, of Uganda system. In Uganda here, the, the price of wheat doubled like twice. It was like around 23 US dollars and now it's at 43 US dollars in Uganda. And this has made many businesses which are mainly depending on bakery, mainly depending on wheat as closed because they can't cope up with the high cost of production. And, and according to the video I've seen, people are really looking at the substitute. What are the substitute? What can they use in, uh, in, in case which is not at all, in case the which is not so uh, 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 affordable to them. So with this, with this, with the current situation, I know the situation, but with the but with the with the current situation, we feel like the this cassava flow is, is is a potential substitute not only to wheat but also other related uh, other mm -hmm. products. Thank you. Maybe some someone can add on. Thank you. Yes, to add on to what. Um, my colleague Ambrose has stated. Um, one other thing that pushes us, that makes this idea very viable for us is um, there are so many farmers who produce cassava and if they do not have a market to sell them, and it gets it mostly gets rotten. So we have access to this cassava, which we could just source and then turn into cassava flour, which would serve as a substitute to um, wheat flour. And because we have it in abundance, the cost of production and then the cost of sourcing the cassava as a raw material is very low, which will enable us to produce at large scales and then sell at lower prices to these businesses. Thank you. Thank you. I, I like the focus on substitution for wheat, which is climbing in price and lack of availability. Um, as a person who spends a lot of time scaling, I will say that I did not see in your plan, as it's shown, a lot of attention to the uh, acquiring of the cassava because it, it will spoil and getting it to your processing plant uh, in good shape fast enough for multiple sources, probably small farmers, is always a concern. And then the distribution of the cassava flour to consumers, to bakers, you know, all of the, the target markets that you have uh, is also a concern. And logistics like that sometimes can uh, cha challenge a very strong business model, the very strong business model you have. So it's just an observation around what could be a constraint as you try to grow both in your current market as well as other markets. But uh, just some thoughts coming from my side. Um, thank you so much for concerning that area because we talked about it actually. And the site in which we are going to locate our factory is a place that, that um, these rural people 
do plan their cassava. So transporting their cassava from the farm to the factory is not that costly as compared to placing your factory in the city. So this was something that we consider as we move along. That is when after we generate some revenue, we have enough cash for logistics that we will take with. But for a start, we thought it is that we should locate this in the rural areas where cassava is abundant and we are not going to spend on logistics. So that's another thing we about to start with. Good. Thank you for that. I will say that your profit margins are so healthy that you should be able to uh, deal with this. In fact, those are some of the pro most healthy profit margins I've seen on, on a commodity. So um, there's something very exciting or something that needs to be learned. I'm not sure which one, but uh, as you scale, you'll as you grow, you'll be able to de determine that. Thank you so much, Rob. Bill, Debbie? Which one of you wants to jump in next? I'm happy to go next. Uh, thanks for a, such a lovely presentation, team. Um, you mentioned, sorry. Yeah, thanks for such a lovely presentation, team. You mentioned uh, the fact that you would be located close to where um, the cassava farmers plant. And so that's how you sort of mitigate that cost of transporting the supply to your factory. Is there any other problem that you anticipate um, you might encounter and how have you already started thinking about it beyond the funding needed to set up your factory? Uh, what challenges do you foresee as you plan to you know, launch, launch this um, factory? Yes, definitely, that is a great question. Um, we thought about that actually. Let's see, after we get to because right now what we are experiencing is post harvest loss. After we eradicate those post harvest loss, there is going to be a huge demand for cassava flour in the market. So, this is what we are going to do. We have some organizations there that do for the high variety of cassava, and which we are going to partner with, and also encourage other women in this rural, rural village to plant more because they have the land available. All we are going to do is to empower them to see that we meet the market demand of it. Okay. To, okay. To, um, sorry, I'm going to go ahead. Yes, to add, to, add on, to add on to what um, my colleague Francis has just said, we also looked at the processing. We, we are very much aware that in these local communities, electricity is not always that stable. So we are looking at it from another angle of um, bringing about another source of energy which would supplement in case of electricity outages. For instance, we are actually exploring to, um, the use of solar energy. Thank you. Okay, uh, yes, uh, to, add on, uh, to add on what my colleague have said, I think uh, we also shared our idea, our idea with some of um, the members around. And then someone was asking, how can you convince me, uh, uh, like how does cassava test uh, does cassava, okay, does cassava test, test as same as wheat? Uh, yeah, so one of the problem maybe with wheat, wheat may be like uh, probably telling people maybe the community mindset about also that maybe they can change their mindset about that cassava is not only for, for cooking, but can also use for what? For baking. Yeah, so I think that also you need to my one of our effort that to, to, to try to uh, to spread gospel around the community. Thank you so much. Isn't that Brenda's job is to uh, get the word out about the uh, the applicability of cassava to a wide range of uh, <laughs> uses? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We even, we thought of uh, having a Facebook page where we'll be able to post like um, local recipes on how to to bake, how to use flour, cassava flour to bake or to make bread, because locally they're already being used, just that people, many people don't know about it. So we 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 hope to share this information so you reach out to many people. Yeah, yeah. on top of using social media, we can also use like, because uh, I know uh, rural farmers, they mainly use community radios, can use community radio, community gathering, even using simple, simple notice. I think that is uh, what uh, <laughs> Brenda will be leading. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just have two comments to, to the team, um, and this is linked to some of the questions that uh, Rob posed. Number one is that I would encourage you to spend some time really thinking about logistics. 
it's going to become an issue sooner than you think. And um, the experience shows in similar projects in East Africa, in Nigeria, that that becomes a problem like very, very, very quickly. So do spend some time thinking about how you would crack that. And at a small scale, it may not be such a huge issue. Once you try to scale up, it's going to become overwhelming very, very quickly. So spend some time thinking about that if you can. The second thing I would say is that um, looking at similar projects elsewhere, it is so important for you to get the best available expertise to help you with the production tools that you're going to be acquiring. Um, they're very simple, but they're, they're, <laughs> they're difficult to run properly. And um, I would just advise that um, you don't want to go through a very long learning curve with this uh, kinds of equipment. Get the best expertise you can ha have to help you to make sure that you run them properly and efficiently from the get go. And then the last comment is again linked to your margins. Whenever I see uh, in Africa commodity margins that are that high, I know there's something wrong. Either you've underestimated your cost or you've priced it too high. Either way, it's not good. Your commodity margin should not be that high. And since you're a social enterprise, just keep that in mind. Um, but I'm sure you're going to refine this as you go through the process and better understand the cost and the, the pricing you can, you can achieve in the market. But there's no question that this has potential to have huge impact. If you can crack this with a low cost solution to convert cassava into so many other uses, besides flour, besides just for, for bread, I think this has so much leverage across the entire continent because it's a very uh, commonly available uh, food source. So um, uh, I wish you guys push hard on this and figure out how far you can go. Thanks. Thank Bill, you so I want to say, Bill, I want to say those are great comments and, and reinforce some of what I was going to say. And let me pick up on one thing that you mentioned, which is um, learn from others. Uh, there are places in Africa that are very active already in cassava production and flour. Nigeria has 20% of the market share, but there's also what Tanzania, uh, DRC, Ghana, et cetera. So you may be able to borrow learning information experience from those folks, which will help you very quickly close in on minimizing production problems, getting costs properly allocated, dealing with these distribution and, and logistics that we talked about. Learning from others could be one of the most valuable things in your execution plan. Thank you. All right, team, thank you so much. Um, and if, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. We have about one last minute if you have any, any final comments, but otherwise we can jump on to the next team. So yeah. feel free to share any last thoughts. Sure. Um, I wanted to say that um, I have some experience working in food processing and I know how um, complicated it could be or how easy it could be for food to easily get contaminated. And that's something we really brainstormed about and considered having a food expert, a food processing expert in our team. And yeah, we are definitely looking forward to learning from companies that are already doing this and trying to improve our product. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda. Yes, um, yes. Oh, go ahead, Francis. Yes, I did an internship in one of the factories in Korea, where we did a um, factory installation for rice processing. So there was an engineer that came all the way from um, Nigeria, which I'm currently in country, and he has been giving me advice on what I want to be done for us to So we are in touch with some experts in doing this initiative. So you guys are already ahead. Um, <laughs> you're already doing the things that we said. That's, um, that's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, judges, for all of your comments and questions and the really interesting discussion team. Um, seems like you are on an amazing path forward and have definitely identified a, a big opportunity in the market. So um, thank you for you know, making our second presentation also amazing and uh, making our judges job increasingly hard when they're going to have to deliberate at the end. Um, we are now going to move on to the final team before we have a quick break. But before that, um, can we just get a big virtual round of applause for Team Kasavati? 
thank you guys and amazing work so far. Really excited to see what comes next for you all. Um, all right, like I mentioned, um, we're already two presentations down, only three to go. And next up we have Team Nobox, which is a STEM ecosystem solution, including mentorship, learning communities, maker marketplaces, and software bundles. And I know that they have a treat in store for us. So Team Nobox, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, please, could we present, because we want to share code and stuff, so we've already presented the way we want our presentation to go. So is it OK if we got the permission to share our screen and then present from our end? You know, the issue is we're experiencing some difficulty around um, so. Okay. Mubarak, we're having a hard time hearing you. Um, wait, can you hear me now? Yep, yes. we can hear you now. Yeah, no, I'm saying we're experiencing some Zoom issues, and I think this is. Is it possible to make um, maybe admin the host for just this part of the presentation? Um, I would lose admin access. So they would have to give it back. Yes, please, no problem. We'll just give it back right afterwards. All right, and then you should be able to host now. It looks like you're the host. Um, okay, so we're starting. So did the app help to solve your problem? Much in your group? Yes, I was able to connect more with lectures and understand the classes. So what's your name I want you to talk? My name is Omo Biamagalos and I'm a STEM student. I was trying to connect with other STEM students to have a collaboration with them and share ideas. No Box creates a community for STEM students in Nigeria to interact and share ideas. I think that's my favorite feature of the app, the fact that I get to interact with other people. I really like that the community is for STEM education only, so there are not much distractions. I'll definitely recommend it to anyone looking for opportunities out there. Less than a few has no better picture. Okay. So to the app how to solve your problem. Dear judges, welcome. Your individual professional journey is inspiring and impressive, but I have some questions for you. How did you get to where you are now? Did you have mentorship and resources or did you struggle on your own? Tech is the new gold, but what happens when millions have no digging tools? Deji is studying computer engineering, but he has no place to practice and is unable to compete with his global counterpart. Kofi, on the other hand, has struggled with getting tech gigs for a long time. He has spent half of his savings on networking. And hi, Oluwada Milola, who wants to build apps to pursue social justice. I have zero background in tech, and there are no available simplified learning resources for beginners like me. The system shuts people in a box. This past month, as a fishbowl challenger, I have learned to step out of the box, which is why our innovation is called NoBox. NoBox is an app that simplifies STEM lessons for users, helping them earn income. It also provides mentorship with STEM experts. It has three features. Firstly, 
the one for all feature. This allows users to post their projects and learning progress whilst getting feedback and ideas from their peers through simple interactions. Secondly, the Nobox Lab is a 3D virtual working space that enables users to conduct circuit designs for their prototypes individually and in groups. Its DIY features replaces heavy lab equipment. Finally, the Nobox Tech Rights. This is the first STEM marketplace in Nigeria, providing support for users in purchasing and trading materials. Think outside the box. We believe there should be no box because creativity is limitless. So what shows that no box actually works? From August to October of 2022, we conducted a prototype on Discord using 300 users and 40 mentors, educating them on computer science, mathematics, and statistics. This determined the compatibility and effectiveness of the no box app, and we recorded resounding success. Our value proposition for users like Damilola and Digi, they will assess simplified STEM resources and connect directly with mentors for better learning through no box. With no box, students like Kofi will no longer spend over 50% of their annual income on networking, collaboration, and research. They will do it at less cost. No box will also simplify recruitment for local talents, running ads, and expanding the customer base for organizations signed up on it. In fact, with a solution like Nubox, future football challengers will find it much easier to bring their tech ideas to life. So what is the size of our market? In Africa, 93.3% have internet access, but less than 25% of higher education students pursued STEM fields due to its difficulty. In Nigeria alone, over 60 million people have internet access. So imagine, if 40% of those people have a solution like Nobox, enabling them to bridge the STEM learning gap, that is a game changer. Our revenue streams. As a social enterprise, how do we intend to make money? First, primary users of Nobox, which are students, can sign up to assess simplified resources for free and high ranking mentorship at a small charge. Both individual users and companies can run ads on their STEM skills and projects to gain traction and earn more. Users can also register to become vendors on the new box STEM market, tech rights, after proper verification for a small fee. They can sell tools and machinery such as drills, rams, and motors needed by new box users. Companies can also enjoy a smooth recruitment process for talent to ensure productivity, while established professionals can sign up as mentors for users with no box serving as the middle agent. There is no end to the possibilities of the no box app. Per user, it costs $10 for six months to access a premium package that would include direct mentorship with experts. For companies and vendors signing up on the no box marketplace, tech right, they will pay a verification fee costing $15 while we receive a 15% profit per sale. Unlike other platforms, Nobox is the first STEM education resource bank in Nigeria. It is also the first deliberately created STEM community in Africa, providing mentorship and collaborative learning across the continent. In short, Nobox is an African solution to an African problem. One of our most valued strengths is that Nobox is digital and can be accessed by all. The weakness we've identified is in getting solid, simplified STEM resources on the hub, but we are already addressing this through partnership with stakeholders across board. There is also a growing demand for STEM skills and jobs. Nobox is bridging that gap, and this is a grand opportunity for us. We acknowledge that competition from more STEM advanced regions of the world can be a threat, but we know that Snowbox will equip the African youth into global trailblazers in the field of STEM. Now that we have stepped outside of the box, finally, we need your help to fly and soar. For this, we hereby ask for $35,000. 
how are we going to use this money? We plan to use, we need to buy APIs, servers, iOS hosting on Play Store, Google Store, domain names, hosting service, database, which will cost around $8,000. For the app development, around $8,000 should be enough. Marketing is the wheel of business. We budget about $10,000 for it. To legalize the process and register no box with the copyright in Nigeria, we need about $2,000. Sales, mark, sales marketing, partner and mentor acquisition, $5,000 and up 1,000 for miscellaneous, bringing it to a total of around 34,000. We also look forward to technical support and learning from the business management expertise in the Fishbowl Network. Three minutes, team. Since the beginning of the Fishbowl Challenge, we have carried out a need-based assessment on our target audience. We also ran a better test on the Discord app so we understand what needs to be done and aim in becoming the number one STEM app in Africa. So, as you can see on my screen here, this is the code for the new written fish, um, the new written notebook app. Here, the user would be able, so on my Skype screen, you can see the screen, the user would be able to sign in with, and when he signs in, he would be able to get and pay for mentors here. And here, you'd be able to buy and sell any tools he needed in his requirements. We'll begin the NoBox website design for digital presence in April 2023 and recruit listing designers. In May, we will officially launch with one for all feature, which will go live on Play Store and Apple Store. By August, we'll build a fiscal community across schools and we'll launch NoBox Marketplace. Tech rights in September. From October to December 2023, we will continue to monitor and evaluate progress while making necessary updates. Oh, we have big dreams for Nobox. In the next two years, Nobox will be notable across Africa for revolutionizing the STEM tech education space. We are prioritizing collective action and partnering with Google Developer Circle to provide simplified lessons. The Ghana National Association of Teachers is to help integrate notebooks use into schools and with local cyber staffs, incubation hubs, and tech spaces, the notebook gospel will reach every part of the country. An amazing and brilliant team behind Dollbox. We have Onye in charge of legal and compliance. We have Chimo Obi in charge of data and statistics. And we have Olu Adamiola in charge of communications, all based in Nigeria. And then we have me, Edmond, the software developer who is in India currently. No box. We believe you should think outside the box because creativity is limitless. Wow. Thank you so much, Team Novox. An amazing presentation and right on time. Um, would love to hand things over to our judges now for what I'm sure they have lots of lots of questions about. Uh, thanks, Katie. Yeah. And thanks, Team Novox, for that very um, exciting presentation um, and creative one as well. I am. Um, Curious on your revenue model, um, you mentioned that you intend to make money by charging students for mentorship. And um, how do you envision that working? Does that mean you'd also pay the mentors to be on the platform? And if not, how do you ensure that you meet the demand for mentors with the need for students who want to be matched to mentors? Because there's always people who want to learn, uh, but then how do you ensure that that demand to supply ratio is met? Thank you so much for that question. First, um, we have the basic features, which we you know basically connect STEM students, which is free of charge, definitely. For the premium, where you get to connect with mentors, we have you have packages for our mentors. Definitely, there are people that are doing well in their space, especially the, the STEM space, that are willing to you know teach other people upcoming STEM like like HRDs, right? So we hope to we hope to have the two packages, which is free again and um, for premium. So mentors that are willing to they're willing to mentor for free. They have their package. The ones that, that wants to you know, make money out of it, that is also that, a package. So we're going to be paying some mentors that, that, are, that wants to make money out of the app. But we also have space for mentors that are just there to give to the community. So thank you so much.
Thanks for thanks for that response. Sorry, just a follow on on that for the mentors who want to give back and for those who are paid. Is there a difference in expectations for those different mentor groups? Okay, thank, thank you, you for that. Thank you so much for that question. So yes, for some people who want to be a part of corporate social responsibility, they could serve on the hub or uh, without pay. But then because we have a premium package, we also have some, we have some where students can pay to assess the mentors. But then there are no disparity, it depends on the, um, the kind of way each person signs on the Nobox app. If you're signing up as a paid mentor, there's a platform for that. If you're signing up as someone who wants to contribute to community or society or to even build your own um, network as a person, as a mentor, there's also room for that. So uh, the, no box is en uh, encompassing for all. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Bill, I've already talked a lot. How about if you jump in here? Sure, sure. Um, two, two questions uh, from my side. Um, as you think of the challenges we have in STEM in Africa, um, I, I love that this is a solution that's going to um, create a more dynamic ecosystem and, and marketplace and connect people who need support um, and also give them access to like-minded people and facilitate them doing their projects. Um, have you also thought a little bit about how this helps to deal with um, the root cause, which is just not enough people focusing on STEM um, on the continent? Is there an angle here for your tool? Because and the reason why I'm asking about that is because I think you can tap into a new bucket of funding. If, you know, um, part of your solution is around expanding the pool of people that are pulled into STEM. I think there's some philanthropic um, funding available to expand our study to, to, um, to women. Um, and so I'm just wondering whether there's some part of this that could be towards, you know, just uh, making it easier for people to get into, into STEM and um, at a very early stage and then progressing through the ranks. That's one question I have. And then my second question would be about, um, as you think about um, the impact that this could have, uh, the social impact this could have, I think it could be useful to, to just help, you know, in your depth somehow um, quantify, um, you know, because I think, you know, we all understand that STEM is important, but I, I like to believe that, you know, you may need to have something that makes it easier for somebody to see how impactful this could be as it, as it scales up and it becomes more successful. And, you know, I just don't know how you can do that, but I would imagine that it's an important part of the story and it needs to be occupied a little bit more. Just some of the two things I have uh, you know, uh, at the top of my mind as I, as, as I listen to you. I Thank you so much for that. So as to your question, when we carried out need-based assessments last year in 2022, some of the target audience we spoke to which our students showed interest in STEM education, but then they pulled out of classes just because it seemed difficult and there was unavailable, like simplified resources for them, especially for those who had zero background in tech. This is why we created NoBox to bridge that learning gap. And for the social impact angle, yes, we, with NoBox, we are improving quality education, giving more young people in Nigeria and in the African continent uh, as a whole, opportunity to tap into the growing market and the growing opportunities in STEM in the global space, giving them a source of income generation. We are also seeing how this our solution you know, empowers decent job creation, even gender equality for young women who due to their environment may normally not be able to um, attend physical STEM classes. And now they have a backup plan. So we are championing quality education, decent job, economic growth, and gender equality as well. Thank you so much. 
Some of our partnerships are with organizations that are already doing the work in the, in the space of STEM education and helping to grow the interest as well. Thank you. <clears throat> well, it, it's a great presentation. It's an excellent business model and you all are very articulate. I have a, a high level question for you. How does your business model ensure that you serve and satisfy the users in your community? Oh, another one of my dumb questions, because the silence always means that I've asked something that, anyway, think about this for a second, because the community is the key to this and ensuring that the satisfaction of occurs on a regular basis, you maintain continuity, you have people sustaining membership, et cetera, is key. And I didn't hear anything in there about um, uh, ensuring that you actually serve them in a way that satisfies them. Tell me a little bit about that. Okay. Thank you very much for your question. All right, so if I'm getting you cor cor correctly, your question is based on how we plan to utilize the user feedback and make sure that our app is servicing the user very well, if I'm correct. It, it's, it, it, has, it has both a feedback and a feed forward question. It's like, how will you create the offerings that will satisfy them? And then how do you ensure that you're meeting the, the goals that you set? So it has more than just a feedback aspect. All right. So thank you very much for your question once again. Firstly, we plan to have a constant user feedback loop where we are communicating with our users to engage with them more through various activities on the platform to engage with them and know what they are thinking, how they want us to improve on the app. So there are lots of feedback sections on that with our user room. And the platform is built based on user need and will continue to grow based on the feedback and the results. So we're going to have focus groups, community events, and other based social events that will innovate these individuals and organize them for us to know what is going on and how to help them and assess them throughout our app. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, I think that, that that's good. And that leads me to the next question, which are the comment first off, which is um, scaling as aggressively as you plan in a couple of years across Africa is no small task. In fact, scaling in general is very challenging and different from a startup activity. And going across Africa, you will undoubtedly come across different uh, user needs, um, cultural biases, market challenges. Um, and so my comment is that your scaling plan is really quite aggressive relative to your current state of development. Um, any thoughts about how you'll facilitate the scaling uh, that you envision? Thank you for that question. So unlike fields like law that has geographical limitations, STEM education is global. And so we have no issues with um, venturing or or entering into new markets across the African continent because the knowledge being shared is usable any, from any part of the world. And also to enhance a more grassroots um, kind of growth, we, it's part of our one year post fishbowl plan to build communities in schools, both physical communities and digital communities that transcend just the virtual working spaces, just like my colleague said earlier through um, event, networking and social collaboration. So this is our, and then we also look forward to partnering with, of course, partnering with organizations and initiatives that already have a base in other regions of Africa, outside of West Africa. And we are, we're sure that this partnership would help us scale and to give us the solid, uh, to solidify our you know, uh, aggressive scale and impact. Yeah, thank you. I hope that answers your question. Yes, that, that shows that you all have thought about it and you have the plan. Again, just a little bit of caution about uh, scaling that quickly, um, growing that fast across uh, established internet markets is something that Facebook and Google and others have done, um, but not many people have done other than that. Or oh, I could also list Airbnb and Uber, et cetera. So um, maybe there's some learning there about how, how they have done it and how you could successfully accomplish it because you will find that it requires a leadership that's ambidextrous 
Um, that includes maintaining uh, your own existing marketplace and, and serving it well, as well as constantly adding uh, and creating new marketplaces. Katie, I have, uh, thank you for the answer. Katie, I have, is there time for one little comment? There is time for one little comment. You get the last comment of the group, Rob. Go for oh, it. I, I, I'm try, <laughs> no not trying to set a precedent. This is sort of off the wall, but it's an encouraging thing. Your STEM and Yo-Yo Ma, the world's most famous living cellist, has pointed out that we really need STEAM. You, you need to have arts in there as well as the technology. So while you're focused on STEM, remember that partially what you're doing is helping these people manage STEAM, that is integration of their background, assuming that there's arts in there, with the STEM elements. And that's an integrative aspect that will serve them very well. So I was encouraged by his comment and I just pass it on to you. Um, it's really Yo-Yo Ma's comment, but uh, I'm, I'm a channel for you in this particular case. And I hope that that encourages you to think more broadly about the offering and the value you can create. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, just a little bit of addition to our presentation. We, of course, we're looking to just a tap into the business expertise in the Fishbowl Network to help us scale and to help us in, in rolling out our project, our innovation. And then at some point, we are going to tie partnerships into government programs that will help to you know, scale STEM education, even outside of Nigeria, which will depend on our network of partners, students in schools. And in our, uh, in our need-based assessment, we spoke to some of the students about how they use you know, tech for heart, music to incorporate the heart into the STEM. So we have put into this and we have put all of this into consideration and we look forward to like rolling it out and getting our innovation out to the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Damiola. Awesome. Thank you so much, team. Another truly amazing presentation and really inspiring and exciting the ambition and also trying to bring um, this type of STEM education in a new way to so many people. Um, and thank you again, judges, for the insightful questions and comments. Um, and now we are going to provide a five minute break for folks to stretch their legs, grab a, some water, coffee, whatever you need to do. Um, before we're back with our final two teams, so definitely don't go away um, because it's it's going to be an exciting end to the finals with Team Aqua Roots presenting right after the break. Um, but I think we can see everyone back here at um, 40, let's go with 45. Um, we can plan to be back here to kick things off. I can't really say a, an exact time because I know everyone's all over the world, but in six minutes from now. Um, and during the break, I think Mubarak is going to play um, a little bit of inspiration uh, in this form of the story of one of our past winning teams, Echo Fresh. So um, if you want to get your beverage or snack and come back and watch, I encourage you to do that too. But thanks again for all of the amazing work so far. Big round of applause to Team No Box. Um, and we'll look forward to being back in a few minutes. Thanks, guys. Tomantos no your boy home day ye. No more do sabrina. Na ya tea no, you will be fanfa. My ye be a woya. A baby tea, but me tea at a forno and tonic bob of a bia. And a duba be so near the crown, puna de gum. The bassa, no man to snap pro. Mens your friend me a queer Mary. Me frack my dear Franchu. Me and Tosi Queenie. When you form a Pamucho Mada Roma, a young tossina, a year in Susina, tossing at Mubrigu Romusa, and never be a big one. They say, Medina has in tossing and I'm giving him in Moscow, and I'm in Mammy Madi Cosin Eduma. They say, Me tossing in a guia from Minadia, I'm the betting to Mada Roma, Sama Mumway, Namu Maya Baby Nayamfa in tossing. Mamma, 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 Mamma,
it started in 2018 when I got enrolled in the university. I joined a club called Inactus. Inactus is a social group that brings together students to solve societal problems using entrepreneurship. So during my first trip with Inactus exposed me to the issue of post service losses in Akumadan community. This issue was very detrimental to the people in the community. So I came back to campus and I was really thinking about how I can leverage on technology to solve the issue of post service losses. Joining Fishbowl Challenge last year was a game changer. I had the opportunity to be mentored by high level senior executives who provided advice and support in building Aquafresh. With Fishbowl's mission to promote global collaboration, I had the opportunity to partner with Arena and Dubeka as co founders from Finland and India. Arena contributed to the development of our product through her research into optimal storage temperatures. Duvika, on the other hand, has passion for environmental sustainability. She helped pioneer an environmental platform and is currently taking lead on drafting environmental strategies for the team. Winning the grand prize of Fishbowl Challenge gave me access to a 25,000 US dollar grant, which brought our project to life. The grant money was used to design, manufacture, and install our very first solar powered cold storage preservation technology in a Komadan community. Our solution is a mix of sustainable agriculture and renewable energy to improve livelihood and ensure ecosystem resiliency in local communities. This solution will help reduce the issue of post service losses in a Komadan by 50% in the next two years, helping farmers increase their total seasonal income by over $1 million, boosting the local economy and improving livelihood among farmers. Yada Mwasi, Echo Fresh for Yada Mwasi, Mada Roma. Obabri wa Mr. Musa Mumaye by being for Yentos in Wee, says Madame Mamma, my year by Bia Dugu. Can you not meet here that Nansa Pepper Nas and Nebia Bear now watching me in Ukraine? In Timu, it's Muya ye come up a fair fair air, I didn't know that was him when you had Jay. They said a woman, you had your pie, Yada Mwasi. A successful operation of our technology in this very first community. We are looking at scaling to major marketplaces in Ghana, which will help us reach over 15,000 small order farmers and traders in the next five years. To Mantu Sino, your boy home a day, then we do Sabrina, now Yatiano, you will be fun for because we have seen my year be a woo here. But Matia at a forno and tonic bobo bia, and a duba be so near the crown, Puna de Gum, and the bassa, Naman to Snapro. Men see a frame a queer Mary, me frakma de Franchu, me and Tosi Queeni. When you form me Pamotom Madaroma, a yen tossing now, a year in Susina to four. A yen tossing at Mubrigu Romusa, a neighbor be a debugu. She said, Medina has in tossing and I'm giving him in Moscow, and I'm mamma, my decosing Eduma. Se me to se nyina agu afu me nya dia me de beti ntima da ro ma yesre ma mo mo ayi na mo ma ba ma ye ba bi na yemfa en to se ni My name is Matthias Charles Yabe I'm the co-founder of Aquafresh My entrepreneurship journey started in 2018 when I got enrolled in the university I joined a club called Inactus Inactus is a social group that brings together students to solve societal problems using entrepreneurship. So during my first trip with Inactus exposed me to the issue of post service losses in Akumadan community. This issue was very detrimental to the people in the community. So I came back to campus and I was really thinking about how I can leverage on technology to solve the issue of post service losses. Joining Fishbowl Challenge last year was a game changer. I had the opportunity to be mentored by high-level senior executives who provided advice and support in building Aquafresh. With Fishbowl's mission to promote global collaboration, I had the opportunity to partner with Arena and Dubeka as co-founders from Finland and India. Arena contributed to the development of our product through her research into optimal storage Great. temperatures. If we could have everyone Dubeka, start hand, things out. She helped pioneer an environmental platform and is currently taking and then lead on we drafting will get started as soon as um, the video wraps up. If the, when all of our judges and um, the Aqua Roots team is all online. And if someone from Team Aqua Roots could just confirm that everyone from your team who's presenting is um, is here over chat or loud, that would be great. Um, yes, everyone is here. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. 
This solution will help reduce the issue of post harvest losses in Akumadan by 50% in the next two years, helping farmers increase their total seasonal income by over $1 million, boosting the local economy and improving livelihood among farmers. Yadamwasi, Echo Fresh for Yadamwasi, Madaruma. Obabri wa Mr. Musa Mumaye by being for Yentosim Way, says Madame Mamma, you by Bia Yedibu. Can you not make that now, Sapa Pepper Nas, and maybe a bear now watching me in Ukraine? In Tumun, it's Muya Yaka, I didn't know what Simonia said. I don't know what you had to buy them. After a successful operation of our technology in this very first community, we are looking at scaling to major marketplaces in Ghana, which will help us reach over 15,000 smallholder farmers and traders in the next five years. All right, well, I hope people had a chance to check out the video. If not, it is on our website and um, super inspiring to see the stories of past teams and also know that um, there's a lot of people sitting in this room today that we could be showing videos about in the next couple of years, um, doing similar things and making similar changes. So um, yeah, and I think I know I see Rob, um, Debbie, Bill, are you guys back with us yet? Awesome. So if everyone is ready to go, um, I can hand things over to the Aqua Roots team. Um, Mumbar, do you have access to our, okay. Um, next slide. So, hi everyone. I was born and raised in Togo until I moved to the United States when I was seven. After returning home for the first time in 13 years, I was devastated by the poor living conditions. This is my 11 year old cousin, Anna. When I saw her, my heart ached be um, because she was so malnourished. Sadly, I found out that Anna is not alone. 63% of the Togolese population suffer from some form of food insecurity. Next slide. Just look at these images. You can clearly see that the root cause of food insecurity is poor food management, unsanitary market conditions, and outdated farming practices. Improving farming systems will allow Togolese citizens to have access to nutritional foods all year. This is why we build Aqua Roots to bring innovation, innovative farming solutions to reduce food insecurity in developing nations, starting with Togo. We believe that establishing stable food supply chains will help create innovation in both food food management and market conditions through implementations of aquaponics. Next slide. I first learned about aquaroots aquaponics while volunteering at my university's farm. Aquaponics is a recirculating ecosystem that creates a mutually beneficial relationship between fish, bacteria, and plant. As I began to research more about aquaponics, I devised a plan to integrate the system within traditional agricultural practices to help increase farming productivity, crop yields, and the range of nutritional food options in vulnerable Togolese communities. Next slide. Our system will focus on selling produce generated by our farm on site and in local marketplaces. We also will implement a waste rebate program where Consumers can bring back their food scraps to Aqua Roots for a discount. Next slide. This January, I returned to Togo again, and I leveraged my connections to form six new partnerships. One of those partnerships was is with Lofty Farm, who will provide us with baby fish and skilled aquaponics aquaculture workers. I also received confirmation from farmers that our system is a good fit to build healthier farming habits. And I discovered that women already donated their food scraps to farmers, so they were high, very interested in our waste feeding program where they will receive a discount for their food scraps. Next slide. My time in Togo has validated that Aqua Roots proposed model can be successful. We have evidence that aquaponics can be effective in enhancing local food production. A case study in Nambia has revealed that aquaponics can help reduce food insecurity while having an annual compound growth rate of 13%. 
And due to the rising food insecurity levels in South Africa, the government has established aquaponics systems in rural areas to address the issue. Aquaponics ha ha has worked in other African nations, so we are confident that it will improve farming in Togo. Next slide. There are other aquaponics systems in Africa, but their focus on deep water cold aquaponics does not provide the nutritional diversity that we provide consumers. We are not pushing, we are also not pushing farmers to adapt an entirely new system like our competitors do, but we're rather allowing them to implement new technological improvements on their farm. Our system has built in specifications to keep our produce prices at market rates while reducing food waste. Our team will also provide educational and technical support to smoothly transition skilled workers to our specialized systems. Next slide. As an extension of our farm staff, Aqua Roots executive team is the most qualified to handle all of Aqua Roots systems. Madam Lawler is the business and finance manager currently majoring in international business and finance at the University of Southern California. And her background and experiences enable her to design, implement, and revise our business structures. Dennis Lepartleg is a software and systems manager majoring in software engineering at Duke University, which allows him to develop our website and make our software systems more efficient. And as for me, I'm Kakeli Logo, and my background in biochemistry, oh sorry, I'm currently majoring in molecular biology and biochemistry with a minor in engineering at Wesleyan University, which enables me to uh, design Aqua Root systems. Also, my background in entrepreneurship enables me to manage our team as the executive director and lead innovator. Being from Togo also enables me to have a personal connection with consumers and potential partners. Yeah, next slide. My extensive knowledge of biological and chemical system cycles has allowed me to create formulations that calculate system dimensions. Aquaponics is, a, is an ecosystem with fish, bacteria, and plant, each having their own optimal growth temperatures, pHs, and specific nutrient needs. Our system accounts for gaps and sufficiently provides the proper conditions and nutrients for all three to thrive. In addition to those considerations, we have to make all the variables that you see here on the slide work together. Next slide. This is Aqua Roots first year setup of our, poly, of our initial pilot farm, which I designed using SketchUp. Using the variables that I talked about in the previous slide, we refined our mathematical model to create ratios and set dimensions for our fish tanks, media beds, and deep water culture beds. And I'll be really happy to talk about more about our um, setup in the Q&A section. Next slide. In order to build our system, we've outlined all the required materials and supplies that we need for each part of our system. Aqua Roots would primarily rely on local suppliers. However, the materials highlighted in green would need to be outsourced. For those outsourced materials, we have already reached out to aquaponics companies in South Africa about the logistics. Now that you've heard about how we will implement our solution, Madeline will now tell you about the financial plan. Thank you, Kakali. So next slide, please. Aquaponics does come with a high startup cost. Using empirical data and Kakeli's observations in Togo, we have updated our startup costs to 45.24K. A majority of this cost will go to the construction of the system itself. Now we are asking for a 35K from Fishbowl, but our system can be scaled up or scaled down depending on the funding that we receive. However, excluding this fixed startup cost, our system will be profitable from year one with anticipated growth profit margins of 62.6%. I am happy to give a more in-depth analysis of our financial projections in the Q&A, but an important detail is that we will be producing 32K heads of lettuce in our first six months, 500 fish, and around 1,300 other miscellaneous produce. Next slide, this graph zooms in on our projected revenue growth and our variable costs, which excludes our year one startup costs. Some content. Next, our aquaponics system has two main components. We have our deep water culture beds, which produce leafy greens and higher profit margins. And then we have our media beds, which grow more diverse produce at slightly lower profit margins. So in our first two years, as you can see in the graph, we will secure our system by expanding our deep water culture beds, which will contribute to this rapid revenue growth. And then in subsequent years, we will fulfill our mission of providing diverse produce by expanding our media beds. We'll experience slightly lower growth, but we'll always have that option option of expanding to leafy greens if necessary. So in the next slide, in considering this revenue growth, we've also mitigated four potential risks. 
Specifically in phase one, when building, we have overestimated our build costs to account for unexpected difficulties, and we will source locally first. In phase two, we are already in discussions, as Kakali mentioned, with potential trade school partners to ensure that we can employ skilled workers. During our harvest in phase three, as detailed before, we will provide a expansion of leafy greens to build a strong financial base. And then finally, in phase four, our financial model does account for high repair and maintenance costs, which I'm also happy to detail in the Q&A. So we understand that our startup cost is high, and we've already begun applying for additional funding. Um, in fact, we are currently finalists for the Davis Peace Grant of $10,000, and Dennis has also officially launched our website, which we will use to fundraise as well. And just to kind of summarize in this, in this next slide here, at the core of our aquaponics farm is our market opportunity. By 2027, we project that our farm can produce enough food to fully feed 450 people on less than 24 cents a day. And Togo's projected increase in vegetable demand will provide us with a a sustained market opportunity to serve this community. So we are happy to detail more specifics about our target market in the Q&A. Next slide. Thank you, Madeline. As Madeline mentioned, applying to grant for grants has brought us steps closer to launching our venture. In the past six months, we refined our idea, improved our team dynamics and efficiency, all while getting real on-site data and becoming finalists for the Davis Peace Grant. In the next five months, we will continue applying for funding, establish our business infrastructure, acquire land, and start construction of our pilot farm. Next slide, please. We know that aquaries can have a positive impact on Togolese communities. That is why in the next five years, we will expand our pilot farm by 40% its original size from three new farm partnerships and feed over 450 individuals with less than 24 cents a day. Next slide. With your support, we can tackle food insecurity in Togo and bring aquaponics to Togolese communities. We can finally provide my cousin and my community with better nutrition. Thank you. And we're now open for questions. Wow, what a way to bring us back from the break. Thank you so much, Team Aqua Roots, and really impressive progress, the vision, amazing, and also that you're already starting to not just apply, but become finalists for other opportunities, I think really shows how much progress you've already made. And um, yeah, super excited to hear some feedback and questions and thoughts from our judges and get to know a little bit more about what you guys have been up to. So. With that, over to you, Rob, Debbie, and Bill. Thanks, Katie, and thanks, Team Accurate, for that uh, well-detailed presentation. I just have one question around who will actually be on ground to manage the logistics and the end-to-end -end maintenance of your system, knowing that all of you are, there's none of you that's actually based in Togo right now. Yeah, um, so I primarily would be like the on ground person. And because I have family there, I'm already like um, forming partnerships and finding like farmers who I can like help train in aquaponics once the system is set up to be like the grand managers. We all we already have like thought about like um, how our employment scheme and how we would have like um, the like general managers who manage everything and report to us. And then below them, there would be managers. And then below them would be like specific farmers. I mean, that work on specific aspects on of like the system itself. So then we don't have to worry about like the huge educational gap if those farmers are already like um, skilled in their um, divisions. Yeah, and if we go ahead and um, if we could share the screen again, we actually do have our our four week implementation plan um, post fishbowl that also kind of uh, details uh, yeah. this this transition in a little bit more detail because I know that that is a concern that none of us will will be on the ground um, in Togo for 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 those those initial months. Yeah, um, um, and towards at the end of our yeah. appendix. Yeah. Um, so it's like the last slide and there's a link there that says four week plan. The la yeah, all the way, yeah. Um, maybe you can press the X for share and then, and then yeah. 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 
So yeah, in this four week plan, we have like most of the things that we'd be um, doing in the prim- in the first month would be just be like logistic things, like establishing our business, getting more grants, and then like connecting with like farmers. Or I've already connected with those farmers, so like just kind of getting like them started on training, and also just like um, working on and completing our educational guides to help um, pe- transition those workers to working on our systems. And I will primarily be traveling to Togo um, this summer after I graduate to like see the whole operation. Awesome, thank you. So thanks, thanks again for uh, uh, an exciting presentation. This, this has huge amounts of potential. Have you guys thought about importing your team with somebody with um, expertise in agriculture, study of aquaculture? Yeah, actually, um, in the beginning of the challenge, I've connected with one of my peers here at my university, who's actually been working on an aquaponics farm for over eight years. And he's connected me with one of his friends who um, dropped out of college and started like a huge aquaponics farm, which I've been in contact with. And um, I've also have been like educating myself on aquaponics systems through extensive like um, training sessions and also reading like a bunch of published aquaponics books. And yeah, so. Okay. I have a mental model that says that aquaponics, um, the history of implementation has sometimes been plagued by pollution concerns. The water and and wastes that come out of the aquaponics uh, can sometimes be de- detrimental to the very local environment and it's caused some concerns. I didn't see that specifically addressed in your presentation. So give me a feel for whether it, it is something that's mitigated or whether you found a way through your biochemical magic, which I do appreciate the complexity of what you put together, um, uh, you've you've managed to minimize it. So So tell me about that issue and what where you stand on that. Yeah, so actually I've, um, through my research, I've seen that like farmers have actually used aquap- like the water from aquaponics and the fish waste, um, like their poop to actually make fertilizer. So how they do this is that they take out the, like we will have a radio flow filter that will take out the poop from the system. And then we will transfer that like, water and then through aerobic um, respiration that like um, like bacteria would break down that poop and make it into like functional fertilizer that we can use on other parts of the farm. Uh, did I see that in your depiction of the pieces, everything from aquaponics? There was something off to the left that looked like treatment. Yeah. Is that where that was? Um, our, um, Can we share our screen again so we could like look at the PowerPoint please Mubarak? Oh, that's okay. You don't. You don't need oh, to take okay. me back. I just. I just. Okay. Point is, I didn't see, as uh, you say, poop treatment, but I didn't see waste water treatment oh. properly addressed or discussed. And it's it's just a concern that will come up with folks when you bring up aquaponics. So I just wanted to get it. Mm-hmm. Is this in our model? Okay. Um. Okay. I'm like thinking. Is it either slide? 10 or, um, I don't know. Can you go to side 10, Mubarak? I'm just not sure like where you're meant, like what you're referring to, but I do know like from aquaponics, like the part of it is that the water is recirculating and it's a system where like, we don't really have to replace the water and the water is cleaned by intermediate beds. Like the plants take up like the like nutrients, like the, like night, okay. So when the fish are in the fish tank, they produce nitrates and those nitrates are converted by bacteria into like, um nitrogen and um, like other forms of nitrogen for the plants to take up. And this will happen in our media beds and our deep water culture beds. And the water will continually circulate in our system itself. The only time we will have to like take out the water is like through that radio flow filter that I told you about. Um, this is like the first step after the fish tanks, then the water will go to the radio flow filters and then the poop will like settle down in there. And then like we would have to replace and clean that radio flow filter. So then that's like the only time really that we take water out of the system. And the water in like aquaponics have been shown to actually be like really good fertilizer just because the bacteria are converting like the fish waste into plant, like nutrients that plants can take up. So I don't think like processing the water would be an issue because 
of the closed system and the fact that if we do take out the water in a system, we will just like put it aside and let in, like the bacteria break down the like waste into like functional fertilizer for plants. I don't know. Does that okay. answer your question? Well, it makes me feel more comfortable that you have a solution. I, I do think that it would be, I recommend that you include something in the pitch just from the standpoint of it removes a concern that has been brought up in the past okay. fairly extensively in literature, et cetera. So I had a question okay. for Madeline. So thank you very much. I, yeah, I think you've got you. it. Um, and uh, Madeline, you were doing the financials on that. Uh, I didn't see a clear economy of scale as you grew up. It seemed that costs rose monotonically with the um, with the revenues. Um, can you give me a little sense about where your economies of scale might occur? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're kind of wondering exactly why, um, I guess on, on a deeper level, why our costs are going up at the almost the same proportion of, as our revenues. Uh, that's correct. what I was trying to um, say. You said it more clearly, but yes, that's it. Okay. So yes. So um, as, as I was sort of um, detailing in the presentation, and there are sort of a lot of technicals behind it, but on, on a very basic level, if we continued at the rate of expanding deep water culture systems, um, I actually have a more like detailed uh, financial model in the appendix, which I don't need to necessarily pull up. Um, however, if we were to continue, if we were to continue doing that, that would basically raise um, our revenue at a much more exponential rate to our cost because there are much higher profit margins on those leafy greens than there are the media beds. So this is a key component that we realized with Kakeli gathering that empirical market mar market data is that the media bed system is not as profitable as we originally anticipated. And so that's why our new model accounts for those, those deep water culture beds. They're basically going to be the sustainable financial base that then allows our system and allows us to be able to do media beds. This is also another reason why media breads haven't been brought wide, like wide scale to total and in other regions um, across Africa because um, they don't provide us as high profit margins. So if we need to, if we're running into issues, our, although our, our revenue is projected um, to grow each, each year, um, if we need to, we can always expand via, right now we have plans to expand one media bed um, in, in 2025, one media bed in 2026, and one media bed in 2027. However, we can continue expanding deep water culture beds as well in or substitute those with the media beds in order to uh, maintain that that stable growth depending on how our system um, works out. Does that answer your question? It gives me some comfort that you all have thought about it and uh, that there there are economies of scale that aren't properly rep or sufficiently represented here. So yeah, I'm cool with that. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for one more question or comment. If Rob, you were you reading my mind. It looks like you had something you're about to say. So well, I, I, I did, I did, I did. I wanted to go back. Um, the you you understand the complexity and the interrelationship of all of these different pieces. And as you said, you've found a balance, a way to balance it. But inherently, complex systems that are dynamically balanced get perturbed every so often, and it cascades through the system. So an upset in the fish tanks causes a, a change in, in the nutrients and things that go to the downstream pieces that, that you're using or, or you know, something like that. Um, this means that operations will require some very smart and savvy people with good information. And um, Debbie brought this up, I think, in the first question, which is, you know, having that kind of talent, the information that they need to read problems or identify problems and then make solutions um, is a challenge. How will you address that? Yeah, so um, the way we're gonna address this is primarily like we are creating an educational guide right now. And we're like either like, we're gonna make a physical copy and we're working on like making it digital in the future. But this educational guide will address like the common issues that happen on aquaponics systems. And then even before the workers start on our systems, they will have to go through a, like a training session. And the reason why we have specialized jobs is so that when this happens, like say the aquaculturist, like who already has knowledge about like aquaculture and this problem, like 
it or he already has like a way of like resolving this, even though it would have downstream effects on like later parts of the system. Then we could say like the person who's working on the media beds would have spe special training to like kind of fix that issue, like whether if it's like cause plants to go like, I mean, makes plants sick and whatever it does, like then we also have like common issues that happen like in our aquaponics books with like pictures and what to do and then like obviously they're going to report to us so then if it's just, like beyond them like in that moment then like we can provide like more solutions and more hands-on solutions and we're making sure that our general managers will be trained as trained as I am um so yeah thank you and as in addition to that as well our financial model does account um around fifteen hundred dollars just to um, repair and maintenance costs, and then another $500 just to anticipated training costs as well, which are overestimates from, from what we originally had. But we just want to be sure that we're accounting for that when we're um, anticipating our startup funding, because we know that those are difficulties that we will inevitably run into. Uh, just one quick point, comment. Are you ladies uh, familiar with Agumatics, Egyptian company that does something similar? Have you heard of Agumatics? Um, I don't think so. Um, I would suggest you take a look at them. Um, they, they started something similar, I would guess, almost 10 years ago. And they had um, some challenges with scaling up. But I think there are a lot of learnings from that experience. Very similar set, setup. Um, they did very well with different grains, uh, such as lettuce, basil, and arugula. We were able to export some of that to Europe. But um, I haven't kept track of them, but I would say check them out. You could get some learnings about the challenges of scaling this up. Yeah. Thank you so much. Definitely Thanks. will check them out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, perfectly on time. Thank you so much, to Aqua Roots. Can we please give them a big round of applause for the amazing presentation? Um, and also thank you for the very thoughtful questions to our judging panel. Um, and now we are almost to the end of um, today's finals. So thank you everyone for hanging in there and thank you teams for keeping everything so interesting. Um, last but definitely not least, we have Schrodinger Energy, who are providing affordable clean water for communities in Nigeria using a low cost water filtration system. Um, team, are all of your presenting members here? Yes, we're all here. Great, then the floor is yours. Growing up in rural Nigeria, we saw the daily struggle of our community to access clean water. The lack of clean water not only affects our health, but it also hinders the growth of our community. We remember playing in the stream only to fall ill days later. But those childhood memory only fueled our determination to make a change. We knew we had to do something and we started by educating ourselves. We read books and did research, searching for a solution to water crisis in our community. And then one day it hit us. We could use our knowledge and skills to build a water purification device. So we go to work in our workshop designing and building a device that could purify contaminated water. We tested and refined it until it was ready for use. With the device ready, we returned to our community and installed it. Good boy. 
their action was incredible. People were overjoyed to finally have access to clean water. We felt proud and fulfilled knowing that our hard work made a difference in people's life. Our story is a reminder that even small action can have a big impact. Access to clean water should not be a privilege but a right and anyone can make a difference with determination and hard working. Can we please have the slides? Distinguished judges, ladies and gentlemen, greetings to everyone present here. I'm Akshata Devan from Schrodinger Energy. We are solving a global crisis of lack of access to, clean, uh, to safe, clean drinking water. According to statistics, only one in 10 individuals have access to clean drinking water. This means we are prone to a lot of health issues. But let me tell you, Schrodinger Energy is the solution to this global crisis. They said, water is life, but water killed my sister. One day, my sister came back from school. She looked so weak and tired. My mom discovered that she was sick, so she picked her up and rushed her to the nearest healthcare center. But before they got there, my sister died. Later on, it was found out that she died of cholera because she had been taking contaminated water from the school tap and also from our home. According to World Health Organization, approximately 800,000 children die each year from diarrhea disease, that is one child every 20 seconds. 2.2 billion people still don't have access to safe drinking water. Next slide, please. There are local and conventional solutions used to make water safe for drinking. But imagine boiling water using charcoal or firewood. It is expensive, time-wasting, and contributes to global warming. Next, what about using purification tablets? It has infinitesimal effects to the user's health at the long run. Plastic bottle is one of the most common solutions in Nigeria today, selling the Nigerian pure water marketing company. But the problem is that it causes uh, plastic pollution and also affects our marines. Also, our fish and rivers, they die. Most especially, it affects our agricultural production. To solve this problem, we developed Rain Light version 2.0, a portable water disinfection system that has two sources of energy, one from the solar and one from the hand crank mechanisms. In the absence of either of the two, one is there to compensate the other. Let's play it next. Green light helps purify water with this. this uh, help. Can you play the, the video? There's a video there. Next. Next. Red light has the capability to purify six liters of contaminated water into a safe drinking water within 90 seconds of operation. It has a small charging station to help charge mobile devices and also to light the environment at night when there's no light. Especially emergency or in rural communities whereby electricity is a major challenge. Next. The system is affordable just at $45. Our technology is very simple. Next. Our technology, can you play the video? Our technology is very simple. It works in three simple stages. The power, the reverse osmosis system, and also the disinfection system. With the help of the power, it helps power the pump to suction the dirty or contaminated water into a reverse osmosis filter, whereby it traps the solid particles, hold them, and allow only the dissolved particles to pass, which is the clean drinking water. But the water at this stage, it is clean, but not safe for drinking. So therefore, next. Play the video. 
go back next previous, uh, there's a video there. So the water then is passed through the um, UV light, which has the power to disinfect the bonds of the virus and bacteria inside the water to make it safe for drinking within 90 seconds of application by removing 99.9% .9 protozoans from the water. Next. For our competition, and there are other, so other solutions helping this water crisis as stated earlier on. Portable aqua consumes much energy in the production process, which makes it expensive and affects the user health in the long run. Even the firewood is free, it has huge negative impact in a sense that it emits carbon dioxide that contributes to global warming. <clears throat> Our product is the best substitute to all these conventional sol solutions as it provides a high filtration rate, is multifunctional, works, with works without electricity, a chemical-free purification device with, with total capacity of six liters, and also is able to provide basic electricity features to its user. Next slide, please. At a global scale, our total material market is uh, two billion dollars, two billion people. Our serviceable addressable market is for 18 million people. Looking down to Sub-Saharan Africa as a startup, we focus on the northwest region of Nigeria, starting with individuals and households in Kanu, Katsina, and Kaduna, while targeting 5% of the market, and our share of the market is 690,000 people. Next slide, please. For our customer discovery, we have interviewed 123 potential customers, which includes households and individuals both in villages and cities of Nigeria and Nepal. The major feedback from our potential customer was that yes. our device will able to our device will be able to provide with simple and faster access to safe drinking water with key insights that 64.5% of the customer are individual and household from rural communities and 88% believe that the basic electricity embedded in the system will be of great assistance to them. While 67.2% regarded the product as portable, affordable to buy. Next slide, please. We will be implementing AA triple R strategy to penetrate the market, which will add huge growth to our organization. This strategy includes five key components to aid our business, acquire and retain customers creatively and cost effectively. We will be acquiring our customers by setting up zones where they can get access to free water for, uh, for a brief period of time. This will lead to the activation and engagement phase where they will have great first time experience. This allows us to retain our customers as well as generate referrals for our product, which leads to purchase of our service. For our revenue model, our revenue will be generated from two simple models, B2B and B2C. The B2B model includes carbon trading and partnership, while B2C model includes plastic waste recycling and direct sales, which are our main source of revenue. Next slide, please. Now, five shares market projection. Uh, we, are, we are considering 5% of the share of the market. We'll be able to reach around 35,000 customers. Each year, we projected selling around 7,000 product buyers at a rate of $45. In the first year, we will make a profit of around $150,000. In the next five years, we will make a profit of around $760,000 while project able in the second quarter of the, of the second year. Next slide. So on, we, are, we plan launching our product within three months. In order to do so, we require an initial investment of uh, $45. In six months, we will spend $15,000 on marketing on, on the site and development. $5,000 on marketing and branding. From month three to six, we will spend $7,000 on production. From month one to three, we will spend $3,000 on certification and patent. In the first, in the first four months, we will spend $10,000 on workshop and equipment. Lastly, $5,000 will go on salaries and other expenses. Uh, this investment will make us reach our market entry stage. Next slide. Next. The implementation of diversity and inclusion is important in our team selection. We have a pool of experience in what we do. 
both in the management, technical, research, and consultation team. Currently, we have three professional members on our advisory board. Our vision is to provide smart and simple access to affordable, safe drinking water to every individual and household. Thank you so much. We are open to the questions. Thank you so much. A big round of applause for our final team of the day and bringing us home on a very strong note. Thank you, Team Schrodinger Energy. Um, and now with the last Q&A of the day, over to um, our judging panel. All right, I guess I'll go first. Um, thank you so much, team, for that presentation. Um, there's a clear need there that you're solving, so thanks for walking us through that. My question for now is regarding your market acquisition. You mentioned that you'd start off by setting up free drinking spots for people to sample um, the solution. Um, I'm wondering how you plan to scale that approach. Uh, would you require each of your team members to be at those spots when people are sampling them? Is it going to be stationed there permanently and people can sample it at will? And if it is, how will they know how to use the machine? Uh, but yeah, how do you plan on scaling that sample spot um, approach? Uh, ma'am, I would like I like to answer that question. Thank you so much for this question. Uh, so, ma'am, the uh, the plan that you know we are going to have is our team members will be there on the spot. They will show them how the machine works, and that is how even we will come to know how the individuals are able to use that uh, machine, as well as we will get insights from that process as well. And uh, the time period for which we are planning to. Uh, go ahead with this process is for six months. I hope I have answered your question. Yes, you, you've answered the approach piece of the question. I guess I'm more um, concerned around how that approach is scalable um, because I guess you're not all based in, you know, the area where you'd be launching this product. So what would team members helping people learn how to use this for six months look like? Yeah, more so based on our MVP test in Nigerian, in Kano State, we take the product to our schools and also our local environment. They test it and they have verified the product that is quite, quite uh, efficient for them. And currently they are, they are disturbing or they are asking us for the product, when is it going to be in the market and they really want to afford it. For instance, we just have to take their numbers and then promise them by the month of June or July, the product will be out to the market for them to afford it. That's it now. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to point out that there is one other competitor or type of competitor that you didn't include in your assessment that is noteworthy, not because they do exactly what you do, but they, they do address the market for clean water, um, Nazava is an uh, operation that uses ceramic filter, uh, carbon, and silver. Their, their um, biochemical destruction rate's not quite as high as yours, but it works by gravity. Uh, and they've sold 200,000 of those uh, starting in Indonesia and now into Kenya. So um, yours is going to, at times, compete with them. Uh, but interestingly, yours may be more valuable uh, in, in even head-to-head -head competition where there's a severe disease threat or the people involved are particularly sensitive, children, hospitals, or the like. So I'm just pointing out a refinement in your thinking about market competition, market expansion and competition. Exactly, such product exists. I am an engineer by profession. And uh, one of the most common solutions here in Nigeria is that we fabricate water treatment plants but the poor people at the bottom of pyramids cannot afford that system. Whereby we use a, we use a, a filtration of stones, gravels, and the rest to filter the water. But at the end process, we still have that same challenge that they are facing, in which we have contaminants in the water, such as virus and bacteria. So at the end process of our system, you have the UV light, which helps to break the bonds and the bonds of this virus and bacteria and make the water safe for drinking. Also, there are other solutions that are similar to that, but they are quite expensive and they don't have their market here in Nigeria. But Nigeria are ready to afford this product and they really want to product it out. That is how we are trying to our best to see that at least we bring it out for them to afford it. 
Yep, yours is more complete in the destruction of biomaterials, um, contaminants uh, than say on the Zava, but they're still at 99% level uh, of, of destruction. So I'm just pointing out that uh, there's other options out there and you'll run into them sooner or later, particularly as you as you move to scale. That's all. So thanks. Thank you, sir. Bill, anything from you? Yeah, we're open for more questions, Mark. Yeah, I think Bill dropped off, but he's back. Hmm. In the meantime, Rob, Debbie, any other questions or Bill, hand it over to you if you um, don't want to put uh, you on the spot right no, after you jump no, back no, in. That's, that's fine. Hopefully I'm not asking a question that was already asked by uh, the other judges. I mean, I had two questions. One was around um, the, the margins that you have for the product. Um, they, they seem quite high. Um, <laughs> And um, again, I guess it's at early stages, these numbers are going to get refined. But um, I, would, I would hope that for social enterprise, if your margins are indeed that high, you need to do something to make your product more affordable. Um, I'll let you react to that before I ask my second question. So uh, actually, uh, regarding the markets, uh, just a present last two months, we won the, uh, we are fine, we are part of the winner of the global com competition of uh, Ericsson, Ericsson Global Competition. So we are able to secure a little fund. This is just during the time of fishbowl program. So we are able to secure some fund in order to pilot. So during the pilot, uh, we have conducted uh, uh, different in in interviews uh, within, within radio station and television station uh, within Nigeria. So from there, we have, uh, we're, Different uh, organizations and NGOs has reached out to us for partnership. So uh, that has enabled us to project our CFs. So we, we already have uh, an NGO that reached out to us to provide them with, with, with about a thousand cases of this, uh, of this product. But we tell them that this product is not yet uh, in the market. We are still on the uh, research and development stage. So. Uh, so uh, on, on, that is how we projected the market because we already have uh, some people on ground, this person on ground that are already uh, ready to partner with us. So we projected selling uh, a, a that quantity in the post year. That is outside the market entry stage because we plan entering markets within six months. If we are able to secure uh, this money to enter the market within six months. So once we enter the market, then we reach out to our uh, potential partners uh, that already reach out to us. Also to that, uh, the Dean Faculty of Engineering of Bayer University Kano, after having heard we won the Edison Innovation Award and uh, thanks to know more about our product, he figured out that our product also has some features in which will help the university students uh, to assess safe drinking water and also to help them see their environment at night and also to study. Because in our system, if you check very well, it has two sources of energy, that in the absence of electricity, the system will still serve. And also it has a charging station to help charge small mobile devices. And also it has the ability to produce electricity at night with two light bulbs so that it can go to shine the environment. Maybe no day you can show them what they can see they can look to see how the system works. This is our first model and also our second model based on our feedback from the MVP. So my question was slightly different. It was more about the pricing for the product. Um, if I look at your margin being as high as it is, if okay. to compare your product to other alternatives, I would say you just do the math about the full cost of running your solution over a year versus somebody who takes carbon filters or a combination of mechanical and chemical filtration or whatever other solution you imagine. You can compare the cost of the solution and just see whether your okay. price is affordable relative to the alternatives. Um, but my instinct was that when I see your high margins, I think it's overpriced. Because normally in this kind of social enterprise, your margins would probably be, if you're very, very successful, in the 30% range. 
not in the 90% range. So that was what my question was more about your, your margins. But again, I'm sure you're going to refine this. It's just an observation. And I would recommend that you compare this with other alternatives. So look at it from the consumer's perspective. Yes. Uh, when they look at the full cost of running the system, uh, because that goes to my second question. Um, I know, I'm very familiar with reverse osmosis systems. And I know that there are some complications with them. One is that you have a, a lot of wasted water. You know, when you force water through these filters, you, you waste two thirds of the water and you only filter one third. Um, it has a high, it gives up a lot of waste. The salts and the rejected materials concentrate and you have to dispose of that properly. Um, so in places where there's not a lot of water, using that water and only getting one third out of the water you put in, is not optimal. Um, I know the cost of filters is always a problem. Um, I know that demineralization of the water is an issue because you take out all of the calcium and magnesium and very often you have yes. to put some back, otherwise it's not healthy for people. So I'm not sure how these issues are being addressed with the solution. I didn't see it in your deck, but I assume that since these are common problems with reverse osmosis, you've thought about them and you have this incorporated somehow. But these are common problems that you should consider. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. You have actually hit the point. That is one of the ambiguity we have in the reverse osmosis system and also high water treatment plants. And we're able to figure out this problem that is why we scale down our own products for people at the bottom of the pyramid to afford and also to make the system very portable. So we made a company in China, which is UVC, UVC uh, Nice, whereby they help us to produce this reverse osmosis um, and these filters, whereby they have low concentration power that will power to allow water pass through them. Because one of the challenges they have in the higher system uh, plant is that they need a very high power of uh, energy and also a high power, a high pumping power to allow the water to pass through them whereby one part of the water tends to be rejected. But the system, you don't have to carry a dirty water, a complete dirty water to put it in there because that one, they use it for distillation and some other stuff. But this one, you must find a water that is a bit clean, but not safe for drinking. By pouring it there, the concentration rate of the power is quite low, whereby the energy that's been pumped by the uh, DC pump is less. So by, the, by powering it, it creates a high concentration at the entrance, whereas at the extreme end, it allows only safe water to pass. So at the long run, the reverse osmosis filter tends to get deteriorated, whereby it holds so many particles, that is unwanted particles. So therefore, you have to dispose it to bring in a new one. That is where we get more of our revenue inside again, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. <clears throat> and I think like that to, oh, is, are we done with time? You have, we have 30 seconds left, Rob. I'd love for you to fill up those last 30 seconds if you want to. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I think that there is an issue around maintenance and repair that I didn't see fully addressed, but filters plug and UV bulbs burn out or get damaged. And so there will be the need to supply um, replacement parts or to to repair things along the way. And that needs to be built into the model, um, both in terms of cost, as well as the logistics. Exactly, sir. So the concept behind our design is to make the design very simple to operate and also maintain. In the sense that just with a screwdriver or a plier, you can maintain the system. And also looking at the UV light, one of the things that causes it to damage or to get burned with time is high amount or excess amount of energy. For our own system, we use DC purely, whereby we have already controlled the amount of energy that is going to be sent. Send energy that is sent above that energy, there is a circuit breaker that helps trigger it out to allow not uh, excess energy to pass through it so as to burn the UV light. That is how we're able to make our system more simple and also simpler to operate and also maintain. Thank you, sir. And, yes, uh, I know. Our next, okay, our next comment, please. Uh, I'm a robot, part of our revenue is selling some of our product there that's called got spoiled or got in the expired, like the like the filter in the system and also the UV light, maybe when the UV light goes spoiled. So part of our revenue is selling those filter to, to the customers and also uh, uh, and, and yeah, the UV light and also the filter to the customers. So this is part of the revenue uh, we are also working on. Thank you. All right. 
Thank you so much team for bringing us home and um, a huge thank you and round of applause for all of the teams that have given really phenomenal presentations today. Um, it's super inspiring to see what has happened just in the span of a couple of months going from not knowing each other at all to building um, and putting together really impressive entrepreneurship ideas that are already being tested and borne out in practice. So um, let's give one big round of applause to all of our finalist teams. Thank you guys. Thank you, Fishbowl, for giving us this opportunity to share our story, share the ones of my sister and also our project on ground. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. And Thank also, all. Um, before I hand it over to Vonana for some closing remarks, um, wouldn't be doing my job if we didn't give some recognition and a big round of applause to our amazing judging panel for all of the attention and insightful questions over the past two and a half hours and um, all the energy and insight that they've brought today. So thank you guys. Thank you. All right. And with that, um, I'm definitely feeling very inspired and I hope that you are all as well. And I'd like to pass it over to Vonana for some closing remarks. Thank you all. And thank you, Katie. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I know Katie already took a moment to thank the competitors as well as our judges. Uh, you could not have said it, said it better, Katie. We could not. We, this is the group we do this for. For To all our challenges, you are the reason we exist. So we're very happy to continue seeing your evolution and continue to support your growth. And to our judges, uh, we could not do this without having your expertise here and so generous to be able to spend a solid four hours with us on the weekend. We know it's not an easy commitment that we ask, uh, but you come through for us every single time. So thank you so much, judges as well. I wanted to take a minute though. Um, I know we've said a lot of thank yous all around, but I just wanted to thank the Fishbowl team. It takes a village on our end to bring this event together throughout the year. Uh, we support uh, the teams through this process, but we also support them after. Many people may not know that the winning teams actually uh, receive support from us for another six months. We work with them, give them feedback, make introductions for them. So our work does not stop <clears throat> with today. Our work will continue. Um, I also want to thank the team because uh, being such a global team, we're always scurrying to meet each other on nights and weekends. Uh, but at the end of the day, I know what we all leave with is just the immense satisfaction of putting together Fishbowl Challenge year after year. So I know this year, many of us have co commented that we can't believe it's year four. So next year will be a milestone year for us. It'll be our fifth Fishbowl Challenge. Um, and we can't wait to launch that for you in May. So uh, please tell the aspiring social entrepreneurs in your life about the next round of the Fishbowl Challenge opening shortly, and we'll definitely do something special to mark the fifth milestone challenge. Um, and with that, for our challengers, uh, you can go ahead and drop off. We'll stay on with the judges for a little bit to do deliberation. And I know you're eager to hear the results. You will definitely be hearing from our team later today. Um, so you'll know how the, how the prize is worked out. Um, and then for those on YouTube live stream, and who are going to watch the recording later, we'll also post the results there within the next 48 hours. Um, so thank you, everybody. And uh, the challengers can now go ahead and drop uh, while the judges and the fishbowl team can stay on. Thank you. Great. I see people dropping off. Uh, Mubarak, can you maybe go ahead?